with the Metro Codes Department, and I'll be presenting the cases to the board for their review in today's public hearings. At this time, we would ask members of the audience to please silence your phones or any other electronic devices so that the board's proceedings will not be interrupted. And we thank you for your consideration on that point. In each of today's public hearings, staff will make a presentation to the board. They will review the correspondence that's been submitted in support of and opposition to each of the cases. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies and even elected officials, as has been presented for each of the hearings. Staff will present site plans, maps, photographs, and other documents that comprise the case record. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the appellant will present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, the board will hear those wishing to speak in support of the appeal. If the appeal has opposition, the board would then hear from those who wish to speak in opposition. At the conclusion of opposition testimony, the appellant will have an opportunity to present rebuttal. Under BZA rules, the appellant has 10 minutes for presentation if there is no opposition present. In contested cases, both parties are given 15 sides to present their testimony. Should the appellant wish to provide rebuttal testimony, that appellant should reserve some portion of the originally allotted 15 minutes. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on the case in question. The board's vested with the power to act on those cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, specifically section 17.40.180. All the section numbers that we refer to today come from the Metropolitan Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County. The zoning code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January the 1st of 1998. I'll introduce the entire zoning code and make it part of today's record for each of the cases. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings because BZA meetings are recorded for Metro Channel 3 or the uh, Metro Nashville Network, yes, Mr. Chairman? the new branding, Metro Nashville Network, and, and follow them on Facebook, and uh, they have a great YouTube channel. So in all seriousness, if you miss these meetings showing live, they archive them, and I think they have about three or four years of these particular meetings. So. And those are accessible through the Metro website, Nashville.gov, yes. and our meetings are also found on YouTube, a regular Board of Zoning Appeals channel that shows all of our old meetings that, since they started recording them. Because of that, it's imperative for anyone wishing to come forward and address the board to come to the microphones at the front of the room, introduce yourself by name and address, and then make the desired presentation. Otherwise, your presentation is not considered part of the record. The Metro Code requires four of our seven members in order to establish quorum. The code also requires at least four affirmative votes in order to grant an appeal. In the event that only four members are present and an appeal fails to obtain the four required votes, the appeal will be re-advertised for the next available public hearing. In the event that five or more members are present that, and an appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within that 30-day period after the public hearing shall be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, a party can appeal an order of the Board of Zoning Appeals. Such decisions would be appealed to the Chancery Court by a writ of certiorari within 60 days of the hearing date. Additionally, an agreed party may file a motion for rehearing within 60 days of the original hearing date. Such filings for the motion for rehearing must follow all the terms from the Board of Zoning Appeals rules and regulations. After that time elapses, no further action can be taken and the Board's decision becomes final. For the appellants, if your appeal is granted, you are required to obtain the permit for which you've applied and do so within two years. Failure to obtain the permit within two years causes the board approval to go invalid and you're back at square one in the appeal process. Should also be noted that if any false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval can be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the Board of Zoning Appeals. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all the cases have been filed in the proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. Uh, before we go into the call for elected officials, I will note as a preliminary matter, there are two cases that have been deferred from today's docket. Case number 2017-224, involving the property at 3410 Granny White Pike, has been deferred to a later date, to be determined. And finally, the last, call, the last case on the regular part of the agenda, case 2017-230, involving the property at 7435 Old Hickory Boulevard in the Whites Creek community, has also been deferred to a later date. Those cases will not be heard today, so for members of the audience who are present on either of those matters, your case will not be heard today, you're welcome to stay, you're certainly not required to do so. 
Mr. Chairman, as you know, this is the point in our preliminary matters where we like to recognize the elected officials who have joined us today, and there are a few, uh, at least four council members that I saw, and maybe five at this moment. So with that, I will take an opportunity to recognize any council members who wish to address the board here at the outset of the meeting. Uh, ladies first, council member Jacoby Adal, do you wish to address the board? speaking. Thank you. I'm Jacoby Adal. I had opportunity to speak with um, with my neighbor uh, at this meeting, and we both have agreed to defer it to meetings uh, so that um, she can have opportunity to meet with the board of her community. And I think after she meet with them, it'll be reconciled, and we'll probably be on the consent agenda next time after she has a conversation with them. Very good. She's any, here. Any questions for Councilor Jacoby Adal? Which case is this? This was a short-term rental case that had come in front of us. Uh, Councilor De John Michael, would give us a little bit number. more information? I got the number. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's case 2017-205. The appellant in question is Ms. Karen Fairbend. The property in question is 312 Clark Hill Crossing. This, of course, was an item A appeal associated with a short-term rental permit. And Mr. Chairman, if that is a two meeting deferral, that would push out to October the 5th of 2017. Okay, is that acceptable? That's acceptable. Okay, any other questions? Do I have a motion to defer the meeting? I mean, just not defer the meeting, defer the, <laughs> <laughs> defer the um, case. Yes. I'll second. Okay, motion's been moved and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. We'll uh, hope everything gets worked out. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, we also have a visit from District Council Member from District Number One, Nick Leonardo, Councilman Leonardo. I'd like to thank everybody for your service. I appreciate your volunteer work on this board. Um, I have the uh, agenda item number one, uh, which is a camp in Scottsboro, a proposed camp. Uh, it's a special exception to AR2A, and um, I believe it should be on the consent agenda today, but I have sent a letter uh, saying that we wish to uh, approve this with conditions, uh, and I think there's four conditions that planning put on there that somewhat overlap, but I do want to commend the applicants, uh, the Smiths, who've worked diligently along with our community to try to come up with uh, a list of of conditions that would be acceptable to the community. So after a year and, and umpteen meetings that were well attended, uh, we have reached a ground that I think the applicant's happy with, as well as the community. And again, I would appreciate your approval and, and thanks for your service. Councilman, we really appreciate your role in this process. As you said, this has been going on for a long time and there are lots of issues that come up, but the fact that you identified the middle ground and what's acceptable to all parties you should be very commended. You should be commended for that. And um, thank you for right. being here. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. John Michael. Okay, well, he'll, he'll be back. Here we go. Uh, we're joined by Councilman Brett Withers from Council District Number Six. Councilman, you wish to address the board at this time? Thank you, uh, board members, for your service this afternoon. I uh, regret that I won't be able to stay for the full hearing, um, but just wanted to speak with you briefly. I have two District 6 cases on the agenda today. The first one is case number 2017-228, which is a sidewalk variance. I'm sorry, is a parking variance. Um, and this is for property that's being developed on Main Street. The uh, property owner has been working with myself and Metro Departments for a long time to bring a really good project there to Main Street. And we are uh, looking at a parking variance that would allow him to basically shift some parking to other adjacent properties that he owns if they were to, to need that uh, parking. It is for a hotel project, and frankly, it's a hotel that's situated about halfway between downtown and Five Points, and so I have every reason to believe that lots of folks will, will not be driving to that location. Uh, hopefully they'll be able to walk to their destination or, or maybe taking a, a taxi or a ride-sharing service to get there. Um, and of course, if we are successful in passing a transit 
referendum. Uh, someday we'll have light rail to get there. So I think that the, uh, the reasons that were outlined in the letter from the planning department as to why a uh, parking variance is highly appropriate for this location and this use, uh, I, I think those stand. And I am in support of the planning department's recommendation and would request your approval um, if the case is not on the uh, consent agenda already. Um, the other case number is case 2017-191. This is for a variance for the uh, conditions of the contextual overlay district pertaining to access specifically. Uh, the property owner has uh, contacted me and actually at uh, a prior hearing agreed to a two meeting deferral so that he could come before the Rosebank Neighborhood Association. And that meeting did take place. We had a discussion with neighbors. I am satisfied having done a little bit more research with the planning department and Metro Water Services that the lot does have um, floodplain issues in the rear, which would uh, qualify for an automa appeal. Uh, I left it somewhat up to the neighbors to determine how to uh, address that if the preference of the neighbors is to have one curb cut with parking pads in the front or two driveways. Again, that's not ideal to have, um, but under these circumstances, uh, that is uh, an appropriate decision to make. So I will, if, if this item is debated, I, I do support the variance. It's just a question of how best to, to accommodate that. But I do support the uh, the variance from the conditions of the contextual overlay in this case for that property on Shadow Lane. Any questions for Councilman Withers? And there's several variances. You're in support of all of them? The Actually, if I may intervene on behalf of the board there, staff has clarification on that. The only remaining variance request is, in fact, for the driveway width question, which is what we're talking about. I think you're with the parking pad. Although the original filing had everything from a sidewalk variance to, what, front setback, among other things, uh, garage door orientation, the plans have apparently been revised in a manner where they're going to be able to comply with the zoning code for everything except the driveway width question. So that's all that's before you. And sorry to interrupt, Councilman, but I thought that would be helpful for the discussion. No, thank you so much for that, John Michael. Actually, this property owner has been in contact with me uh, and, and working on this for a while, and the plans have been revised so that the uh, height, um, uh, footprint coverage, all those criteria meet the contextual overlay. Uh, and in fact, the driveway doors themselves have been removed uh, from the design, so it'll look more like a traditional home front. It's just that they still do need to meet uh, parking uh, in that area. And so uh, it, it's kind of unfortunate <laughs> that sometimes this, this is the case. Frequently with contextual overlays, we do receive a request to uh, allow two driveways, and usually I oppose that, because that usually is a main reason why neighbors want a contextual overlay, is to preserve, is to limit the number of driveways uh, going through areas and, and preserve green and open space. In this particular case, the, the greater need not to interrupt uh, land that's in a floodplain is, is, a great, is a more pressing life safety need for the neighborhood, so um, I'm, I'm willing to support that variance this time. And to your knowledge, all the neighbors that were in opposition are now satisfied? Um, I have reached out to the Neighborhood Association a couple of times just to see if there was any specific feedback from neighbors, and I haven't received any additional since that time. So uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the applicant did appear at a Rosebank Neighbors meeting, and we had some discussion about that, and uh, I have not received communication from neighbors necessarily either way. Uh, so if, if it were to come up in discussion this afternoon, I just wanted to clarify that I do support the variance. It's just that there are a couple of different ways that that we could go about uh, accommodating that parking in the front setback. It's just a matter of if there's a preference from the neighbors of which way to do so. I believe what the uh, applicant is wanting to do is to uh, move forward with one curb cut with um, parking pads, basically. Uh, but I, I believe he has offered to do some landscaping adjustments that would help to mitigate that. Any other questions? Anything else to add? No, sir. Thank, Thank you, you, Councilman. Wood. Thank you all. Mr. Chairman, we're also joined by District 5's council member, Councilman Scott Davis. Mr. Davis? Thank you. Thank you, committee members. Um, thank you for volunteering your time. Um, and I want to thank the code staff for always working hard and diligent, even after hours. 
without overtime pay. I'll just remind you that. Um, the matter in my district, um, uh, 190 is on consent. Um, I have no issues with it. Um, please keep it on consent. Um, the, um, the builder is actually a constituent of mine also. He lives in the Cleveland Park area off of Lishy, and he's a very good neighbor. It's been good to the neighbors in that area, so I want to keep that on, on consent. But also, even though it is not in my district, uh, me and uh, Councilman Withers do share a lot of Main Street and Gallatin Road, and my district sits right behind 809 Main Street. Um, I'm in support, even though it's Councilman Withers, he has the brunt of the um, decision making in this process, but just as an assistant to him in his area, the developer is has always done what he said he was going to do. Um, in fact, he had a building that was half in my district, a build and half in Mr. Withers' district that he did. It was the Amplified on Main, did a great job, did what he said he was going to do. Um, came to a community meeting with my neighbors for that building, even though half was in Mr. Withers and half was, was in my district. And so I have a lot of faith in this developer, more than most, that he will do what he says he's going to do. And I just want to throw my support right behind uh, Mr. Withers for this project. And thank you for your time, ladies okay. and gentlemen. Any questions for Councilman Davis? Thank you for being here. Mr. Chairman, we're also joined by Councilman Steve Glover. Councilman Glover. Thank you, Chair and members of the board. Um, <clears throat> I'm here to talk to you today about uh, case 217-160 is the first item that I have up. Um, it was my understanding that it was, it was just strictly to really talk about the sidewalk variance uh, and having further discussions with Mr. Michael. Uh, I think there was some confusion on my part uh, and some of the neighborhood area. Um, with that in mind, we had a public meeting a month or so ago, I can't remember the exact date, uh, which nobody showed up for in opposition to. Uh, and it's my understanding with federal law, there's some guidelines you guys will have to follow that I am not aware of and, and I'm not versed in. And so with that in mind, what I'm asking for is if we could defer this one meeting uh, for me to be able to reach out to the neighbors and help try to be a kind of a layperson to explain what that is. Uh, and during that time, hopefully, I will also be able to file legislation on some variances with regards to the size sidewalks. Uh, this makes no sense. If, uh, if I talk about the sidewalks, this makes no sense to put 195 feet of sidewalk in the middle of kind of a rural area. Uh, it doesn't make sense. There's, it doesn't connect to. And so I think a, a little further clarification would be uh, helpful for me and also for the neighbors. So with that in mind, I do ask for a one meeting deferral if that's okay with you, Chair. Would you be willing to defer two meetings? Uh, yes, that's fine. That, that gives me more time. So yeah, that, that's fine. And it allows me to reach out to the neighbors with a little okay. more time. So let's have a motion for a two meeting deferral for this. I move that we defer case uh, 2017-160 two meetings at the councilman's request. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of a two month deferral signify by saying aye. 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 I mean two, two meeting two deferral. Meeting. Yeah. Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, two meetings. And John Michael, what is that date? October 5th. October 5th. We'll see you back here on the 5th. Okay, and then if I may, I, I have another case, the show cause case. Yes. I don't know if you're planning on deferring that today or, or not, uh, mm -hmm. or where it's going to fall. You are thinking it will oh, be Oh, I'm deferred. not sure. Where that okay. Is. All right. So I, you know, I don't know if I need to speak on that now, or if if you're thinking you're, it's going to be. You're, the you're free to speak on it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when I was here before, you know, I specifically spoke out uh, against it because we have some very clear rules with regards to STRPs, type ones, type twos, and type threes, but this specifically is a type one. Uh, I had to leave due to obligations I had, but I was able to watch it uh, and watch the meeting. I know you guys were here for a long time at the last meeting, uh, and so I was able to complete what I had to, and I was able to watch it. I think there were some things that were said that absolutely are not true there. If it's not gonna be deferred today, I would ask this board to seriously consider taking the full one year uh, on the suspension simply because I think we have been very clear over the last several years with the council. Uh, we're, we're working diligently right now on clarifying any misunderstandings, uh, determining on type twos, type threes, on, on what we should do with those. But 
I find it hard to believe that you don't understand what the rules are with it, with the amount of good discussion and everything else that's taking place. So I renew my request mm -hmm. that a one-year suspension on that be done. If in fact, though, it is deferred today, I know there was a 30-day wait period on it uh, before they could reapply. I would ask the continuance on that until the hearing is actually held and we move forward with it. Okay. And with that, Chair, I appreciate your time. Yes. Any questions for the councilman? What's such case number? It is 160. It's, I mean, 183, 183 at the very yeah. end. So. I do have a question. Um, I know there's a lot of um, committees regarding the STRPs, and I was just wondering if you could give us an update as to when maybe, is it Bill 2, um, 2017-608? Is that the name of it? I, I'm not the sponsor yeah. on it. I, I know the sponsor is trying to go ahead and move it forward. Where it goes, I'm not sure. I know the committees are working. I know the committee, we have a special committee on STRPs right now to try and work diligently to try and find that middle ground uh, in, in trying to weigh and balance what the state may do versus what we may do. Uh, and and, and we're, we're not there yet. Uh, but I know that we're working diligently to try and find that answer. Uh, but to speak on behalf of the sponsor of 608, I, I, I'm not qualified to. But, but I know they're trying to go ahead and move it forward. And, and that's fine. We just hear about it and, you know, not able to watch all those committee meetings. I'm not even sure if they're televised. So we were. That one, I'm not wondering. sure. I, I know that with the beginning of this, uh, this last two years of this term, a lot more of the committee meetings are now being televised, or there, there are plans to be televised. Uh, on that, uh, I do know that they're hoping, and I could maybe ask some uh, my other council members here. I, I think they're trying to get back with us within the next 60 to 90 days on what the recommendation would be, and I, I, I don't believe I'm misrepresenting that, but please don't hold me to it. And Mr. Chairman, just to follow what the council member shared, uh, the present scheduling for bill number 2017-608, which is the ordinance to which Ms. Karpnick referred, is presently set for the first meeting in October. Okay. However, if they had to make any changes, it seems that the uh, intention of the sponsoring council members is to bring it quickly after that date, if for any reason they had to defer while the ad hoc committee from the Metro Council continues its work in uh, analyzing these questions. And is, if I may ask, Chair, is, is it kind of your understanding, Mr. Michael, that we're, we're looking at about a 60-day window that we're trying to uh, get the ad hoc and, and to, to come back with suggestions? Presumably even less than that, because okay. I think the hope had been for that committee to provide their feedback in time for the uh, whatever schedule the October, of bill number okay. 608. All right. So hopefully that gives you some clarification. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Any questions? Thank you for being Thank here you, Chair. again. John Michael. The Board of Zoning Appeals utilizes a consent agenda. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to today's hearings and identifies the cases where appellants have met the criteria for their requested action. The reviewing board member determines that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts on that case. Then it is recommended to the board for approval. We'll enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended, and if anyone is here in opposition to one of the cases we identify for the consent agenda, just raise your hand, make sure that I see you, and the case will be removed and heard in its regular order. All right, the cases recommended for consent agenda are as follows. First, case 2016-127 for the property at 5056 Pine Valley Road, a request for a special exception to allow camp use in the AR2A Agricultural Zoning District. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 2016-127? Seeing none, that will be on the consent agenda. The second case recommended is case 2017-190 involving the property at 1344 Stainback Avenue. This is the item that Councilmember Davis addressed the board on just moments ago. The request for a side setback variance. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 190? Seeing none, that case will be so recommended for the consent agenda. Next, case 2017-216, involving the property at 2740 Whites Creek Pike. This request is for a special exception for religious use in a residentially zoned district, as well as a variance from street setback requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 2017-216? Seeing none, that will be recommended for the consent agenda. The next case is 2017-221 for the property at 225 Hillwood Boulevard. A request for a rear setback variance for the property at 204 Cantrell Avenue. 
sorry, I skipped ahead. Uh, case 221 is for the property at 225 Hillwood. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 221? Seeing none, that case will be recommended for the consent agenda. The next is the very next case on our agenda, case 2017-222, involving the property at 612 Estes Road, a request for a variance from your setback requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 222? Seeing none, that will be on the consent agenda. And the final case recommended for consent is the accidentally previously referenced 2017-225 involving the property at 204 Cantrell Avenue, a request for variances from side setback and allowable footprint requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 225? Seeing none, Mr. Chairman, that gives us a proposed consent agenda with the following six cases, 2016-127, 2017-190, 2017-216, 2017-221, 2017-222, and 2017-225. We would solicit a board motion. Okay, that is the cases that I reviewed and moved to the consent agenda. Is there a second? I'll second. The motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion about the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Consent agenda passes. John Michael. The cases that were on the consent agenda are now passed. Your case is done. There will need to be no hearing. You're welcome to stay. You're welcome to leave as well. The staff should be ready to assist you with permitting as early as Monday of next week. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, as uh, some folks disperse from the crowd, we'll go ahead and set up for our first hearing. Sure. Before Respectfully, staff would recommend a mild alteration of the agenda as presently composed. Okay. The show calls hearing for case number 2017-183 involving the property at 5229 Earhart Road was heard at our meeting uh, on August 17, 2017, our last board meeting. However, based upon new information that was brought forward to the board and re uh, with regard to representations made to the board, the show calls notice was filed, sent out to the appellant last week. So we'll check first to see if the appellant is present, if that pleases the board. Sure. Uh, the appellant on that case was an Andrea Smith, the property owner, Thomas Bauer. Are either Ms. Smith or Mr. Bauer present for case number 183? Seeing no response, Mr. Chairman, it's entirely possible the notice has not been received yet. However, the board does have the authority to either proceed or defer to a later date. Sure. I think in this situation, since notice was sent out, I think last week, um, let's give them 30 more days to do this. As Councilman Glover said, he would l recommend that we keep the, I guess, um, that they're, they're no longer eligible to apply until we resolve this for a short-term rental. And I think that would be um, the consideration in front of the board. Is there any discussion about this? So. Uh, or I forgot what the result was. Did we just give them 30 days or did we? On Mr. Harper's motion, it was a wait of 30 days from the last hearing date. Uh, as I understood the suggestion from the council member in the chair, it might be to extend that 30 more days to make sure we can get the show cause hearing in front of the board uh, on October 5th without a permit having been issued in the meantime. So uh, were we legally on doing that? Do, do we have to have a hearing to, to change a decision already rendered without doing the show cause? Or? You can address that. I think actually the board has the authority to make a motion to extend the order as presently issued since it is in conjunction with the show cause hearing. Okay. To wit, the board could proceed on the show cause hearing even in the absence of the appellant in this I'm, case. I'm okay. Although that seems a bit I'm harsh, okay I suppose. deferring the, the show cause. I just want to make sure that we were uh, okay to uh, amend our decision. I think that's probably fine given the um, information that is now before you all that, that there is new information for you to consider and you're deferring it for that reason. Additionally, although I don't believe we've gotten, I believe we sent the notice out certified and regular mail, so I think, and also the agenda is published, okay. so I think there has been sufficient notice for you all to give the additional 30 days, knowing that it will and come back receive, up before you and you all will They'll it receive new notice on the, the Right, amendment. and then when, when, it, when the show cause comes back before you, it'll be dealt with at that point, so it's not an indefinite and, extension. And if they don't show up in 30 days, then we will, we'll, hear we'll hear it. Sure. In their absence. Uh, can I let the record reflect one thing, uh, that I was not present at the August 17th hearing, however, did have an opportunity to review it, so I will be able to vote on that. So, so yes, let's um, 
move on the show cause hearing. So is there a motion related to? I'll, I'll move that we defer the show cause hearing uh, two meetings. And uh, that are, we, are we amending our decision? Well, we're just leaving in place that they are not eligible for a short-term rental until uh, the determination of the show cause hearing. Okay. Does that sound okay with you guys? I'm looking at legal counsel. Yeah, I think essentially you're staying the decision that y'all made and pending this okay. the resolution. That is exactly what I'm saying. Calls. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. So, John Michael, before we get started, I, I want to say, you know, in our, in our country, we're we've had a massive storm in Texas, and there's one about to bear down on Florida. So. Those of us who were around here in 2010 remember the generosity of strangers, even from other states. And I know there have been a lot of Tennesseans that have gone to assist our friends and strangers in both Texas and Florida. And so please keep those folks in your thoughts and prayers and help out in any sort of way. We have a long history with both of those states. Uh, of course, our former governor, Sam Houston, was the founder of the Republic of Texas. And uh, most people don't know our um, seventh president, Andrew Jackson. Before he was president, he was the first military governor of Florida. So we um, are geographically close to both those states. And what their experience is, is right now is horrific. So we hope that um, they are able to recover and, and restore, and as we did in our 2010 flood. So John Michael, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I know the board had contemplated possibly altering the docket in a manner to take up some items where you have staff presentations that need to be made separate from uh, zoning staff. Did you wish to take those up first or have the board consider that? Yes. Um, our, our staff, needless to say, is just slammed every day and it's been a kind of short week or month with the holiday. So to get our planning staff back to helping out others, we want to kind of hear all these cases at the front end. So yes. That is our wish. With that, we will take on the cases that involve requests for sidewalk variances first, although they are out of order. Um, although one has already been, de two have been deferred, one today and one previously, that will leave cases uh, 223 involving the property at 43 Industry Street. Uh, case number 226 involving the property at 2555 Park Plaza. And actually the third one was deferred also, so that's only gonna be two quick hearings. He said optimistically. Um, case number 2017-223 is the first case then that the board would hear. If we can invite the appellant to come forward, Jack Hughes is the appellant for Richard Perkerson, owner of the property located at 43 Industry Street. Staff will try to queue up that case. The request is for a variance from the sidewalk requirements in the IWD zoning district, that's industrial warehouse zoning district. The uh, plan is to construct a new warehouse at that location. The request for the variance from sidewalk requirements, of course, comes um, in the wake of the implementation of Council Bill 2016-493, I believe it is, that created new sidewalk requirements or update to our sidewalk requirements in Metro Nashville. The zoning map shown here gives you a sense of the location of this property along Industry Street. Um, the aerial gives you a better sense of the placement of the railroad tracks adjacent to this property in this industrial district. The site plan submitted gives you a sense of the proposed layout of the industrial warehouse, more so a layout of the lot as it currently exists. From my recent site visit, a view of the property to the interior, a view across the street in the upper left-hand corner, and although they are relatively small here, a view up and down Industry Street on either side of the metaphorical tracks and literal tracks um, in the lower left and lower right-hand corners. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 223? Okay, Mr. Chairman, I believe you sometimes like to hear from planning staff first with regard to their formal recommendation yes. on these to complete mm -hmm. the Metro presentation. Then we'd have a chance to hear from the appellants. Good afternoon. Um, as you know, this is uh, triggers the sidewalk requirements and in this case it's a four foot grass strip, five foot sidewalk 
um, along Industry Street. Um, where our perspective on this is we're looking at uh, the property in a little bit longer term time frame. So the uh, community plan, South Nashville community plan, identifies the area as a future urban mixed use neighborhood. So we see these uses probably transitioning out over time, um, going away from industrial um, to uh, residential, commercial type uses over time. Um, the proximity of the, of the property is uh, about a um, half mile from Nolensville Pike and three quarters mile from Murfreesboro Road. And so both of those are identified for future light rail in the in motion plan. Um, and, and so our disapproval um, is really hinging on the fact that we envision this area uh, changing out over time. It's positioned between Trevecca, uh, Wedgwood, Houston, Chestnut Hill, and both of these uh, light rail corridors. Okay, question for the planning department and our sidewalk guru. <laughs> guru, I like that. Would, would you be opposed uh, if the boards have found uh, if, if we ordered them to pay into the uh, the fund? Yeah, we note that as an option that if you uh, find that the, the variance should be granted that they pay the in lieu fee. So help us out here. So this is a, obviously an industrial site, but as you kind of look in the future and all you have to do is look at some neighborhoods that probably used to look like this and are now full of artists and condos and other great amenities, uh, restaurants, that here, there are no sidewalks here, there's a railroad track that goes pretty close to the street. So given that the railroad is so close, could you even legally put the sidewalk so close to the railroad track there? Looking at the, uh, the overhead shot. Yes, yeah, so I believe they proposed the building in the area where uh, it looks like there's parking today. Um, and so there would be- The sidewalks would be on this kind of horizontal street? Or Correct, okay. on Industry Street. So it's that there. street, whereas the railroad is running, um, intersecting industry. And it wouldn't have to be on the vertical street? Correct. So they wouldn't be building sidewalks along the railroad track. Okay, that's what I was yeah. asking. Any other questions about this? Okay, thank you for being here. And we'll ask you any questions if we have any in the future. Okay, the applicant. Yeah, uh, my name is Jack Hughes. I'm an engineer with Fisher Arnold. My address is 256 Seaboard Lane in Franklin, Tennessee. Um, <clears throat> and uh, our appeal is based on the fact that there's a existing uh, culvert right where the sidewalk construction would take place and uh, that would all have to be removed. And that was recently put in by Metro at, uh, as the owner requested it, you know, to solve some flood situations there. Some is that uh, the one by the railroad track there? Well, you're pointing at it. It's, that's, yes. yeah, it's running this way though. Okay. It's coming this way. It's, and it uh, takes up about 20% uh, of the frontage of the property. And then the rest of the property, you know, we'd, we'd have to get a, a entrance ramp into it. So okay. do you have any I, objection of paying into the sidewalk fund? Not really, no. No, sir. Okay. Um, questions? Do you, have, uh, do you wanna say more about your case? This is uh, Scott Ferguson, mm -hmm. he's the son of the owner. Oh, wonderful. Okay, questions, board members? I just wanted to make sure I understand. When you say it, the the uh, culvert is 20% of the frontage, what, what do you mean? Uh, Going across or coming back into the property? Uh, the, the frontage of the property is 50 foot, and so it's taken up about 10 foot into that uh, 50 foot. So, and it would have to cause that, would have to be reworked. And it was recently put in by Metro. I, I, in my opinion, it's, you know, to put 50 foot of sidewalk construction on this street at this time is kind of unreasonable. I think putting money into the fund is more reasonable. Any other questions? Do you have anything else to add? Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing. Discussion, board members. Um, I'd, I'd be in favor of 
uh, supporting the variance in, uh, in the applicant paying into the in-lieu fund. Would you like to make a motion? I will so move that we approve and the uh, applicant pay into the in-lieu uh, fee for the frontage. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion about this? We could add um, that they dedicate the right-of-way. Oh. That was also noted in the planning. Uh, I will if, if I'll accept that amendment. To dedicate the right-of-way for a future sidewalk? Yes. Okay. Is that okay with Richard? Is that okay? Okay with me. Okay. All right. Motion's been made, properly seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Well, it wasn't unanimous. Oh, passed. nope. Oh, well, uh, no. Okay, good. We like to sit. Okay, sorry. Good luck. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the next sidewalk variance case is case number 2017-226. This involves the property located at 2555 Park Plaza. This is the road that runs right behind Centennial Park between uh, Centennial Park and Charlotte. Aerial map here shows the mixed-use general alternative zoning site in its proximity to Centennial near the far kind of southwestern end of Park Plaza. Uh, somewhat dated, the aerial shows where they're prepping for the construction of a parking complex to serve the various office buildings along this area. The site plan submitted shows uh, a representation of a number of trees along the strip there with Park Plaza before you get into the interior of the lot, and that's part of the question here. Um, the request before you is for a variance from sidewalk requirements and a variance from landscape perimeter strip requirements as well. I know that the um, applicant has worked extensively with our urban forester, Stephen Kibbett, as well as Metro Public Works in order to try to identify some alternative arrangements because in this instance, to put the sidewalk in where it normally would go, would necessarily mow over some of the trees shown in these photographs from today's site visit. Uh, the upper left-hand corner is across the street. The lower right-hand shows um, the front of the property near where it intersects with the business end of the 28th, 31st uh, extension corridor as it spits out onto Park Plaza. From the interior, somewhat of the interior of the lot, one of the alternatives suggested involved the hashed area shown here with yellow paint on the, I guess in this case, left side of the planted trees, such that an interior sidewalk could be continued from the corridor and continue on to link up with Park Plaza further on, on down the street, thus preserving each of the trees. Another view from deeper into the interior of the lot showing those trees in their current condition. The developer, to their credit, Mr. Chairman, was put in an unusual position of being told by the urban forester, hey, don't knock down those trees, and by public works planning and zoning, hey, man, you got to build a sidewalk. So looking for alternative arrangements, the developer has reasonably come here, filed an appeal, seeking variances that will allow them to proceed with their project. Um, although some alternatives have been presented by Metro, they've not been something that's necessarily worked um, to the preferences of the developers. And so Mr. Philip Piercy is here as the appellant on behalf of HCA Realty, Inc., the owner of the property at this location. Uh, Mr. Briggs is familiar with this case and can address staff accordingly. Yes, Mr. Briggs, come back. So, um, here's the dilemma. Do you get rid of the trees or do we connect particular neighborhoods? This is right near Centennial Park, I know. So, kind of what's your stand on this? Yes, uh, so uh, our opinion, um, you know, this area would require the five foot sidewalk, four foot grass strip. Um, our understanding is that the building of the sidewalks, even with a reduced grass strip, would still impact the health of the trees. Um, and because this is such a short gap and connects to the 28th, uh, 31st Avenue connector that was just completed by Metro. The Francis um, Guest connector. Yes. Um, uh, we feel that the sidewalk needs to be built. Um, but at the expense connection. of the trees? Um, now, if there's an alternative design that we can work out, um, I, I think uh, we'd be open to that. I had not heard um, this alternative of potentially um, using the area that's striped here. I'm not sure if the um, appellant um, finds that as an agreeable solution or not. Um, it may require some different design work on their Because behalf. on the right side of our picture, that's a public street, and on the left side, that's the private it's property, the correct? Okay. The parking lot. So, any questions for planning? Okay, we might have questions later. We'll hear from um, HCA. So, 
what do you want to do here and do you like trees better or sidewalks better? <laughs> I'm Philip Pearson with SNME here to represent HCA. And as described, we kind of got this conflict between two departments that have viable points on each side um, of their area of expertise. Um, we have met out at the site numerous times with Public Works over the last four or five months trying to resolve this matter. And the one item that they had suggested was to bring the sidewalk up into the private portion of the property uh, in that area that's striped. That area is striped temporarily right now to provide access to the parking garage that driveway goes under the 28th, 31st connector. So actually, when all this project is complete, there will be 18 spaces that will return there that have been there previously and they'll, they'll return back okay, there. Okay, so this is the overhead space, so you can see the little grass strip with the trees at the bottom, and so what you're saying is this will be kind of a striped parking lot and there will be four rows of cars, so if you put a sidewalk through there, you'd be putting it you'd through one of the be eliminating, proposed rows. Right, you'd be eliminating one of those, that row of parking, which ACA has just built this, this project, which is essentially complete. They added on to the building for their stair loon interior renovations, but they added a large parking garage on the other end of the site. Um, and so the the price of the value of parking is, is, a, is a premium to them. They spend a lot of money on getting additional parking and they wouldn't want to lose additional parking. So we've tried to work out a way to get a sidewalk in the right of way where it, where it should be. Um, but you'd but have to take out the trees. We'd have to take out the trees. And so the net result was in meeting with Public Works, they said, we want you to just do funds in lieu of. Was instructions from Public Works, asked us to go to codes and pay our fees. Um, and when we did, John Michael made us aware, well, you're not, you're in the UZO, you can't just do that. You have to go before this board. Sure. That's what brought us here today. And you would be in favor of that? To put the the HCA would in. prefer to, to keep the trees as well. They would? Mm -hmm. Okay. It, have you discussed with the urban forester perhaps uh, planting maybe three other trees on the site? Uh, yes. Uh, no, I haven't specifically said that to urban forester, but that would be the intent if we had to put in the sidewalk. You would, we, you would we'd, relocate? We would put in new trees behind the Three sidewalk. new trees. Okay. Do you know when these trees were planted? I do not. So you're kind of compromise, if you will. You want the trees and you want to pay into the in-lieu fund. Yeah, that's a good shot. I guess that's during the winter of this little strip and, yeah. It's about 250 feet of sidewalk. The odd situation is, for some reason, I don't know why, property has right away, right right there where the trees are, and right in front of the HCA building, the park comes across the property. So we're now required to put a sidewalk across the front of the building, and then the property comes back out to the right away in front of the garage where we did put a sidewalk uh, on the other end of the site. Um, so there's a, even if we put a sidewalk here, there would be a gap that didn't connect the sidewalks. It doesn't, sh it doesn't show, but um, if you go back to that picture, the right of way juts back just right across the driveway. Right where it says, right where it says park place. Oh yeah, you can see the green right there in the, on the zoning um, <coughs> between the road and the, the pinkish color. So yeah, a dil dilemma here, board member. So um, we haven't closed the public hearing yet, but any more questions? Well, I want, can I ask planning another, uh, another question? I, I think everybody is wanting to uh, endorse the new sidewalk recommendation and certainly the shady sidewalk recommendation, but this this sh is going to come up in the future. I mean, it seems to me 
a little unreasonable to want the sidewalk when there's still going to be a gap. Is there no other alternative? I mean, can we not just walk on the green under the trees? I mean, what's, and I, I just, I don't know if you could educate me. Sure. So uh, our concern would be, you know, it wouldn't meet ADA requirements. And so most, not everybody can walk on you know, that type of, of path. Um, what about uh, putting it across the street? Uh, there is park property across the street, I think. Um, you know, that leads up to the dog park there. So we'd have to talk with parks. Um, and I, I know be a they, reasonable place to put a sidewalk and not get rid of the trees? Um, that's a potential solution. Um, I, I think we view it as, um, you know, if we can get the sidewalk in, that we can replace the trees um, onto the side. But as you as can well. even see in this so. picture, people are just walking in the street on the, right. right? So if there was a sidewalk there, people would be using the sidewalk. The possibility of the sidewalk on the park side of the road was explored as in one of our meetings out there, in a couple of our meetings out there. There is a, from the back of the curb, it inclines pretty good back up the bank. So there's a great issue on the other side, but there's also some power pole phone boxes and all that down all in the way at the intersection of uh, Park Place and, and 31st on that side. Um, and then there's, so there's we no- We can see it in this picture here, sort of. By yeah, it, it, it's off to the, the right. Uh, behind those parked cars, um, and so the um, and there's no sidewalk anywhere on that side for a f section to link up with, and so that that option was kind of tossed was it, out. Was it mainly the topography issues that kind the of the topography and those phone box issues down on the end? Because there's quite a few large pole and and several electrical boxes and phone boxes. Any other questions? Well, I have one other question. In order to meet the ADA requirements, I mean, how are we doing this around the city? Are we posting at certain intersections where, you know, to say this is not uh, accommodating or this area is? Because here's my thinking. I mean, for people that can uh, traverse that area, we can ask them to mulch it or have a gravel path or just leave it as is. I, I hate to lose the trees myself. It, you know, we want to accommodate everybody. Is there another way to do that? Uh, typically to meet ADA requirements, it needs to have a five foot path of travel. Um, and it has to meet certain grade requirements. Um, usually Public Works is looking for it to fall within the same a plane as the street center line, so it would fall adjacent to that. Um, you know, I think the one alternative of somehow avoiding the trees and working it on site, we've been open to that in some instances uh, to where that works, because we feel the same way as you, that we just don't want to tear down trees unnecessarily, uh, but we do think that there's a functional aspect here of uh, that you can see from the photos where people are needing to walk. Um, along the property uh, frontage. That green strip that we saw in the um, one of the previous slides, the part that belongs to parks, will Metro one day put a sidewalk on that area? So there is linkage. I think that's for Christian. the same tree issue would exist there. Those trees this. continue across all the way up in front of the building. So they may or may not, I can't speak, you know, in what time public works or somebody would put a sidewalk there, but you're gonna run into the same issue. So the 440 Greenway is being studied by parks right now. Um, and one section that they're completing is between Centennial Park and Elmington Park. Um, it does sort of snake through this area, so where you see the IWD property and where the park's headquarters um, is today, um, they're trying to figure out how to eventually connect it up to the 28th, 31st Avenue connector. Um, I think they view uh, the site where the dog park is um, across the street as uh, a way to potentially connect up there. Um, I'm not sure there's additional discussions that need to be held about the parking that's on the street there and maybe repurposing that space to handle the bike and walking movements through there. Um, that's another alternative, but the design on that hasn't been finalized. 
at this point. Um, and that again only gets you walking accommodations on that one side of the street. Any other, I mean, this is just one well, of these really hard cases. Any other questions about, so, I mean, did you, it sounds like you considered everything here, you know, sidewalks across the street, taking down the trees, putting a sidewalk there, not putting a sidewalk there, putting it on the HCA property next to the trees. Replacing the trees. Yeah, that is what's in our uh, report, is that uh, putting in the sidewalk, um, as prescribed by the Metro standard and, and working with uh, planning's community design to, to figure out appropriate tree replacements. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. We're gonna, anything else to add? We're gonna close the public hearing discussion. I, I wish Stefan was here, because uh, I'm, there's this thing I, I call tree math. It's, it's not a one for one thing. When you take a tree out, you don't just get to put any tree back. But I think, you know, look, how many trees was it, three or four? Look at five. Well, there, there were four on their drawing that, that showed that needed to be removed. Michael, can we see the tree slide again? Yep, looks like five. Oop, well, four. there's there's seven on the drawing and they're showing four of them being removed in the side, with the sidewalk option. Um, sheet EX2 point I'm trying to get to is I don't know what caliper tree would be appropriate to replace those there's three 10 inch trees and one 12 inch but I think re, you know planting new trees on the site and other locations and, and building the sidewalk is you know a not unreasonable compromise and I, I think the applicant indicated he was they were willing to do that I hope, I'm kind of looking yeah. at him Looking for a head nod. Yeah, but they said they prefer the trees, but, you know, I think they obviously want to move forward, but well, I think, yeah, well, but let's we, ask the applicant again. Can you come forward and we're going to open up the public hearing again. And Mr. Chairman, as the applicant comes forward, I will note the reference was made to Mr. Kevin Arbin Forrester. I think he anticipated being here today, but anticipated this case being called much later in the docket. Oh, gotcha. We chose to take it out of order, which is totally fine, but okay. I didn't want to make it sound like he was derelict by no, not no, being no, here. No, 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 no. So, um, my answer. One, Couple of questions. Sure. Um, even the, we those plans that we submitted were our original just submittal plans where we took out the trees that we thought conflicted. Stefan felt like even the upper two trees, and there's actually a tree across the driveway where the sidewalk would stop. Um, that, that those trees, the sidewalk would be under the drip line, so he still had an issue with the two that we had not planned on taking out. Uh, it was a concern, and you know as I said we had looked at numerous options one of those options was to um, put in the sidewalk and put in replacement trees Stefan didn't like that oh, he didn't like it at he all. didn't like that idea but just because you know we would we would not put we would put in street trees that are required I think our tree density units do not count on these trees some of these trees are in and out of the right-of-way um, and so they would not count toward um, our tree density units anyway. Um, but if we were required to put in the sidewalk, we would just put in trees based on the on the on the street tree requirements, which I think is every 40 feet. Um, but that's Steve uh, Stefan would prefer to keep the, the larger trees, and that, and HCA would prefer to okay. just leave the trees and, and move on. But you know, we'll defer to y'all. Okay. Gotcha. Another question. Um, had you all talked about omitting the four-foot grass strip and just bringing the sidewalk to we the did. road? And that was one of the other discussions. The, the grade, particularly on the lower end toward 28th, the 31st connector, the grade comes up, and so that still felt there was a concern that that would get into the roots and damage the trees. And so we looked at putting it right against them the back of the curb, but um, that was ruled any, out as well. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. We're gonna close the public hearing again. So, they, it sounds like their first choice is really to kind of save the trees and leave those where it is. So the question is, 
Do you just leave the trees and have them donate into the sidewalk fund? Or do we try to make them build a sidewalk somewhere, taking away space, parking spaces? Well, or well, I, here's my thought. I, I sort of feel like the walkability is so important, especially in that area. And while I don't want to lose those trees, it is right next to Centennial Park. It's not like we're in a desert right there. So there is a lot of green space. So in this situation, and because of the importance of the connector right there to get to the transit, I tend to say we take out the trees and put in the sidewalk, but I'm open for discussion. I, I agree. I mean, uh, you know, trees will grow a lot faster than a sidewalk will for sure. I mean, if they paid into a fund, I mean, I mean, there's never going to be a sidewalk there for this very reason. So, you know, if, if we don't say, well, you got to cut down the trees and get this And we saw some, just these are just randomly taken pictures by John Michael, but you saw people literally walking. Right. And there are a lot of people that walk people around this area. area. Right. right. And and it's not just, it's not just connectivity and it's nice to have sidewalks. You know, there there's a segment of the population that requires a sidewalk. Sure. And, and I'm not talking about just pedestrians. I'm talking about, you know, people with disabilities you know need these sidewalks they don't need to walk in the street you know it's not safe for anybody to walk in the street there are a lot of apartments on the other side of the francis guest connector on charlotte and i imagine people walk through there to go to the park or even go to the dog park which is i guess the other way so yeah i think the walkability is very important on the site well and here comes the hate mail i'm sure but you know i'm i'm gonna move that we uh I guess we are denying the the appellant's request and and order that the sidewalk be built uh, per planning's uh, specifications. I second that. So, the public hearing is closed, but um, we, I think I just want to clarify. Okay. Yes, let's, I'm going to, for that very reason, I'm going to open up public hearing. What is your request? Our request was to um, bury the sidewalk unless paid into the fund mm -hmm. or overrule Stefan's um, requirement to save the trees. Okay. So, so you're fine with overruling and putting the sidewalk there? That, that, that was our second, second okay. option. Okay. So. Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. We have a motion that's been made and properly seconded. Discussion. This is, a, this is a very hard case, um, but I really think the walkability issues in this location really is bigger than these trees. And as we pointed out, there's it's close to Centennial Park. We could plant some trees, but the connectivity of this area, and that's obviously why we built the Francis Gas Connector, is to connect. And if we just kind of at the, literally the base of the Francis Gas Connector just it go nowhere and there's no more walking, I don't think that's good either, so. Regarding um, the motion, um, do we need to add um, about overruling the urban forester, would that be proper to add that? If that's gonna be part of your ultimate, if that's the ultimate end result that you're going for, yeah, I think you need to include that as okay. a requirement. I'll accept that amendment. Okay. Who so, amendment. yes, any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Good luck. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I believe that would bring us, oh, take a quick break. Uh, we'll reconvene after a short comfort break with the top of the agenda. Okay. Yeah. Okay. be present. Mr. Chairman, in the absence of the appellant, that certainly changes my presentation today. I'll defer to the board as to how best to proceed. Do we know any information? I mean, obviously, we notify, we put this on the line, et cetera, et cetera. It has been a while, I guess, since the original case, so board members. And I'd like to ask our board member from Southeast Davidson County, what do you think? Ms. Sanford. 
I'm greatly surprised that our appellant is not present. I suppose I'd like to know why. Uh, having gotten into a traffic jam in, on Nashville Street today, it's quite possible that she could not get here. So I would like us to consider giving a, uh, at least one one meeting. Okay. Continue. Would you like to def uh, make that motion to defer? I move that we continue this case one meeting. So maybe put it on the heel of the day's agenda. Yeah, I mean, we could put it on the heel of the day's agenda. And yeah, uh, that's do we true. need a separate motion after that? Then? Just for good measure, let's. And then if we have to defer to a okay. later date altogether, we could talk about that October 5th now, meeting potentially. Let's, how many people are here today? And Okay, so uh, does that change your opinion? Would I be out of order to speak, sir? Yes. yes. So, <laughs> does, 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 does that change your opinion about either deferring it and, you know, because what time, we, we have been here for yes, and I know we have an hour and a half. Yeah. So, it's probably, and we haven't heard from the applicant, have we? So, I think it's probably unlikely that they're on their opposition. Yeah, well, they're. Are, is everyone who raised their hands opposition? In opposition? Yep. Okay. Ask them who submitted the letter because we have a lot of letters and we could not let them come back and rely on their letters. I think okay. so. I think let's say, let's put it to the heel of the docket today. And you still want to put it to the heel of the docket? Yes, I think I will. Even if they. When I saw that many people here. Yeah. No, I'm just saying I'm not so sure if the day. people are coming. So we could heal it to the docket, and then three hours later, these That's people right. have, have sat waited, here, right. and then nothing happens today. So I think it's Maybe. more respectful of their time to say, let's defer to meeting. Because I, I don't think, you know, my experience is, you know, if you're not here at the top of the meeting and we haven't heard from you, they're probably not coming. I will just withdraw my motion, period, and allow us to continue as we would in any case where the appellant does not show. Um, may I ask a question? If the appeal was denied today because of a no-show, then what is, I guess they can uh, reapply at any time. And so yeah, John Michael, walk us through this. If we were to deny it because they weren't here, do they have to, it's, can they, A, can they refile, and B, do they have to pay money, and how does that all, how do they get back on our agenda, if at all? To your two specifically identified questions, yes and yes, an appellant can refile, and an appellant would then pay the filing fee, which I, I think in this case, with a commercial operation, residential property, is just a $200 fee. That's usually not the separating factor. The unasked question, though, is the important one, how long do they have to wait? I believe our board rules say that to file the substantially the same case, which obviously a special exception for daycare use, followed by a special exception for daycare use is the same case, you'd have to wait six months pursuant to board rules. Unless, of course, legal counsel disagrees with my now outdated interpretation of the law with regard to that question. Okay, so board members. You may want to check with legal counsel to confirm that, Mr. Chairman, because I think she may disagree. I think if your reason for uh, dismissing it for failure to appear, mm -hmm. the rule says um, the appellant will be eligible to reapply and you know, shall pay the filing fee and the case will be re-advertised for the next available docket after dismissal. So I think if you're dismissing it for failure to appear, it is at the next available docket. Six months, I think, is if it's dismissed for a different reason. Okay. Does that change anyone's opinion on anything and how should we proceed today? I said we entertain a motion. Okay. Anyone have a motion? I'm sure. <laughs> I move that we uh, dismiss the case and uh, not approve the request uh, based on uh, the applicant not appearing. Okay. Motion has been made to dismiss the case basically for failure to appear. Is there a second? I'll second. And there's been second. And any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to dismiss the case signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Everyone's in favor. John Michael. The next case to be presented to the board is 2017-188. This is an appeal involving the property at 884 Elm Hill Pike. 
not too far from downtown. Vista Outdoor Advertising is the appellant on behalf of Charles Hardy, the owner of the property at this location. The request is for a variance from height restrictions, specifically height restrictions for a billboard. In this, the IWD Zoning District, the height limitation is 50 feet for this subject location and the request is for 75 feet. The site plan submitted here gives some indication of the proposed sign area in the upper left-hand corner of the property, shown very near the interchange of Interstates 24 and 40. From my recent site visit, the upper left-hand corner from the street or parking lot area shows not deep enough into the lot, but at least the general direction where the sign will be located. And in the lower right-hand corner, the primary view of the business located at the subject address. In the lower left and right, the views up and down Elm Hill Pike, obviously not as directly affected by the placement of the sign, the view directly across the street as well. Um, the appellant is represented by Mr. Joey Hargis, Baker Donaldson. Mr. Hargis, is there anyone here first in opposition to case number 188? Seeing none, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Mr. Hargis. All right. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Uh, again, my name is Joey Hargis, uh, law firm Baker Donaldson, and to my right uh, is Mr. Steve Blackshear with Vista Outdoor Advertising, and to his right is Mr. Charles Hardy, the property owner. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we come before you today uh, based off a height variance, and I would like to announce on the offset, we're going to amend our request. It's advertised as 75 feet. We're going to reduce that height down to 65 uh, to become more compliant. Uh, Mr. Blackshear obtained a, a permit to construct this, this billboard back in July of last year, uh, completely unaware that, that on its uh, western property boundary will be a new construction which is occurring. Um, in April of this year, obtained electrical permit to start construction. The next door property obtained their permit in November of 16, so some four months after Mr. Blackshear obtained his permit. Uh, it became pretty obvious once that building became under construction that this building was going to com virtually completely block Mr. Blackshear's uh, billboard, and we've given you this packet. This information is something you already have, but this one exhibit you do not have uh, previously, and what we did was took the, the plans for the building next door and the grade of that site along with the grade of our site and superimposed Mr. Blackshear's proposed billboard over top of it at the 50-foot mark as advertised, and you can see from that graphic that's here that that this building is going to cover up virtually all of that sign. So our request coming for you today, and it's an unusual request I met you you guys at least in my tenure here and in your tenures uh, have not seen a request similar to this. So obviously it's a unique characteristic under your hardships in this particular form. So Mr. Blackshear, as I said, obtained this permit without any knowledge of it occurring. Uh, we did look at the the existing building. If you've seen the site there at Fessler's. And 24 is a rather tall uh, three-story building. Mr. Hargis. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me, just so I can get it in my mind, on your uh, exhibit that we're looking at, the top of the building is 529 feet. If you, and I just don't have the math quickly, if you take your billboard to 65 feet, you're saying it'll be 536 plus 65 or, what is, or what's the addition there? Uh, the addition there, you're going to have 50 more feet. So our original request was 75. It would right. completely clear the building. What we're going to do is drop that and then slightly lower okay. the, the height, I guess, of the panel, of the face of the sign. So we'll shrink the face somewhat and where, it'll, where it will appear over the top. So the of top of the building. billboard will be at what height? We'll be at... Um, 65 overall. Well... And that would be that would be 15 feet on top of the number that's listed in. Okay, that so 536 plus 15. Yes, the 536 is at 50 feet. Okay, It'll thank be 15 you. 15 feet elevation on top of that amount. So that's the situation that you had here, obviously, as that okay. construction went along. Uh, I did investigate for Mr. Hardy, who's also a client of our firm, uh, the, the overall building height that perhaps this, this building was being constructed in error of its SP rezoning, and we investigated and found it does comply with the code. It is rather tall. As most folks generally believe that that stories are 10 to 12 feet, this is this is quite a large structure. Uh, so that is the hardship that we have in this case. It's the unique situation that trying to capture the the view of traffic from eastbound I-24 here. Uh, if you're familiar with the site, as you drive, you're eventually going to lose visibility with the overpass. So in order for my client to, to get the visibility from the eastbound 24, we'd like to raise it to 65 feet. Uh -huh. 
for the purposes of this record, again, this, this hardship's not self-imposed. This is something that was discovered four months after his permit was issued. And there's obviously no injury to the adjoining property. Uh, Mr. Hardy had spoke with representatives of the property owner next door. They have no issue and not, not present today. Um, okay. Any questions for the applicant? Sir, can you identify yourself? You spoke earlier for the record. Stevens. My name is Stephen Blackshear with Vista Outdoor Advertising. Okay, thank you. Any questions? One of the things, too, I'd like to point out, if you notice on the, the, the shape of the property and, and how the buildings sit, in a, in a typical zone uh, for CS or IWD, as that property typically would be zoned, you'd have a 20-foot setback for their structure off of I-24, and it's actually, the SP allowed them to go 10. So if you factor in that their building was allowed to come closer to the interstate, and the, and the height of that building, you see the issue that we have with our Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay, we're going to close the public record. Thank you. Thank you. So, building goes in front of billboard, billboard blocked. Discussion. It seems to me that based on what Mr. Hargis has described, uh, the setback to I-24 as well as the size of that building and the uh, timeline of when the billboard was supposed to be constructed or perm was permitted, uh, it seems to me that the variance is reasonable uh, at the height of 65 yeah, they feet. Can, they change your request in all to 65 and there is no opposition. So, anyone have a motion? I make a motion that we approve the request of variance based upon the uh, hardship of the size of the uh, proximate building and the timeline of apply, allowing the permits. Okay. I second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? And I, I'm sorry, I would say the variance as requested today, which was for 65 feet. 65. Is that fine, Mr. King? Yes. Yes. Motion's been properly made and prop, uh, properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you all. We appreciate you. Thank you all. And I appreciate y'all's service too. Okay. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented is 2017 number 191. Uh, Adil Muhammad, the appellant, and Adil Muhammad, the owner of the property, located at uh, 1009 A and B Shadow Lane, requesting variances, in this case, just from driveway width. The original notices that had gone out indicated a number of variance requests, including but not limited to sidewalk requirements, garage door orientation, front setback requirements. However, with the rework of the plan, as previously discussed by Councilmember Withers, based upon his consultation with the property owner and uh, the appellant's counsel, Joey Hargis, who maintains his seat for this next case, uh, we're down to just the one request, which is for driveway width um, amendment. The aerial map show here shows uh, the property in a previous condition. The proposed layout shown with their site plan gives an indication of the two units that would be constructed at 1009 A and B. From my somewhat recent site visit, the property as it backs up to the Shelby Bottoms Greenway, the view across the street in the lower right hand corner, and the view up and down Shadow Lane shown here. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 191? Saying no one, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Gentlemen. Good. Uh, again, thank you uh, for hearing this case. We were originally scheduled for the August 3rd agenda, and I think on that agenda we, we may have been on consent. Uh, the councilman appeared at that hearing in opposition along with a couple of neighbors. Uh, my client uh, to the right here, Mr. Jeff Checo, uh, agreed to defer the case for, for one month to meet with the neighbors. You, you heard the comments from uh, Councilman Withers. Uh, the, the hardship in this case is the floodplain that's located at the rear of the property. Uh, if John Michael, if you could, if you wouldn't mind, if you'll uh, to the site plan, thanks. Uh, in the uh, in the contextual overlay district, you are allowed to have parking in the front yard once you clear the front setback. Uh, if there were no floodplain, which our client has at the very rear of the property, you you could potentially move those houses back and build your parking area. But he's unable to do so, and the hardship is that floodplain issue. Our proposal, as you've seen in a couple of requests, is a single driveway at 12 feet with two parking pads for the um, for the homes that are here. Um, yeah, the, the as, as John Michael talked about, the variances that were listed on the appeal, those have, those have long since passed. There was uh, some confusion about a sidewalk variance at the adoption of the new sidewalk ordinance. It was determined by planning that no sidewalks are required, so that one obviously was for Trump. Um, 
the clients here, if you have any questions about the neighborhood meeting or, or any of that, uh, certainly welcome to, to speak on that. But that's our our request is to allow that dry parking area to be wider than 12 feet uh, with the hardship to the state of the floodplain. Okay. Questions? No? Anything else to add? Yes, okay. We're going to close the public hearing. Discussion? So this was the one that Councilman Brett Withers said he supported now with just the driveway. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any discussion or a motion? Well, I'll make a motion that we approve the request for the, uh, I turned off my docket, the, drive, the driveway width, wait a minute, the driveway width variance. Uh, based upon the hardship of the floodplain. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? A second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Good luck. Appreciate it. John Michael. The next case to be presented to the board is case number 2017-198. Matt Shields is the appellant on behalf of Andrew and Wendy Lundberg, the owners of the property located at 2423 Elliott Avenue. The request is an item A appeal regarding a short-term rental permit, a permit application that was denied by staff based upon prior operation without the required permit. Aerial view shows the property here, and although somewhat dated, the face of the subject property from the tax assessor's website. Is Mr. Shields present? Come forward, please, to make the desired presentation to the board. Is there anyone here uh, present in opposition to case number 198? There are, and board members will note also a late email that I do not know if it made it into your packet from the council member in um, expressing opposition to the case. That's Council District 17, Colby Sledge. His email expressed opposition to the appeal as well. Um, with opposition present, the appellants will have 15 minutes to make the desired presentation. If you want to save any portion of that for rebuttal, save it out of this originally allocated 15 minutes. Please introduce yourself by name and address and make the desired presentation. My name is Matt Shields. My name is Matt Shields. I live at 1009B North 5th Street. Um, Andy is my client here. I'm the, one of the owners of the management company that represents this property. Andrew Lundberg. Uh, we're at the residence of 2423 Elliott Avenue. So, so generally what happens is this was a miscommunication between my company and his real estate agent. Um, we have multiple properties that we represent around town and never have we ever operated without a permit. Um, the agent had relayed the information to him that the permit was obtained and the permit was filed for. Whose agent was that? That was our agent from Empire Realty. And why did that person think that you all had a permit? So they went down and filed for it and were approved for it, but there is a second portion to the, the permit where the fire marshal has to come out and check yes. the, there yeah, so they had, they were approved for it, um, for the, for the type of permit. So we, we retained the information that it was a clear go through my client to, to operate. So we listed it and received, you know, a few bookings, but as soon as we found out that the permit was not completed upon the note on the door, we shut the operation down and then did uh, long-term rent. We, we have a client in there now, but they're not short-term rental, they're renting on a monthly basis. So um, this was a complete miscommunication by us. We've never had ever an issue with this before. We always abide strictly by the rules of the permit. I'm always in the permit office, you know, obtaining short-term rental permits uh, correctly. So this was a one-time thing that, you know, com it was a complete misunderstanding between me and the agent. So is this a real estate agent? Yes. Yes, it was. So why, and they're not, and why aren't they here today? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, honestly, but they, it, it, what is it, is it Wendell's his name? I didn't ask him. I didn't ask him to come. I didn't know that he was going to be needed. I, I suppose I should have uh, realized. Well, what did he say? He screwed up here, right? He I'll, told you you had a permit and you didn't. I'll take the blame for it. I mean, I'm going to fall on, on the sword here. I, I, but he's a real estate professional. Right? He should know our rules. Uh, well, assumingly. You know, he knows how to sell a home. That's what I understand now. 
you know, I don't know how to sell a home or rent a home or do anything with a home. I mean, I can tell you about what I do, but that's that's not pertinent here. By no means was I uh, had any intention of fooling anybody within the government about what we have. In fact, I don't even really care if we make any money off of the home. My intention was to have a home in Nashville, as at some point we'll probably end up living there. My wife comes there all the time. Now, we've kind of shut everything down. Matt put somebody in there for, uh, for the long-term rental, which means now my wife doesn't get to come down and I don't get to come down. Uh, again, that's okay. As I said, I'll fall on the sword here. It's not anybody's fault except for mine. I don't claim that uh, ignorance, you know, allows us to, to not follow the rules, but as, certain, as soon as we found out, which was almost immediately, he found out and we shut everything down. Did you buy this house to live in or as rental property? Uh, actually, we, we bought it to live in. My initial intention was to have the home because we come down to Nashville a lot. Uh, getting a hotel in, in Nashville is almost impossible anymore. And then once, you know, we noticed we, about a year and a half ago, we were at an Airbnb and thought this would be nice to have a home and if we can get it rented, so be it. If we can't, I could care less. Mm -hmm. That wasn't my intention at all. In fact, honestly, I don't like other people's trouble, but since it does cash, well, it should cash flow the home, it, that's okay. So you had it posted. Did anyone ever rent this on Airbnb or another site and stay here? Yes, someone has. We had How we, many? So I think we had three before we found out that it wasn't permitted. So as soon as we found out, like I said, we shut it down, put a long-term tenant in there. And we are very particular, or my company is very particular about who we put in. We even installed decimal readers in all of our homes to ensure that there is no parties or any of the opposition side's argument of why they shouldn't be there. So, so if there is, if you get a reading of 80 or 85 decibels, what do you do? I will show up and evict them if they do not turn. Two so in the morning you'll show up? Oh yeah, I've done it before. Trust me. <laughs> okay. Questions? By the, way, by the way, we have somebody, we have somebody from Florida right now there. By chance, they came up. In the back you eat. And, well, well th they were there, but they said they had to bring their animals up, which we don't typically allow animals. We said, go get your animals, put them in the house. We're not letting that happen. They're oh, evacuating they're, Hurricane Irma. But so they're the long-term. Yeah, they're a long-term tenant, so they're bringing their animals up to, um, you know, evacuate from the from the hurricane down in West Palm Beach. Okay. So, so questions of the. How long is the long long-term tenant? Do you have a lease on that one? So, yeah, we do a monthly agreement. Um, so far, they've renewed for another month. So they've been there They've been there for a little while now, I think maybe two to three weeks, I'm assuming. Uh, but um, they've already asked us to renew for another month. So they're going to be there for another month. That's hardly a long-term agreement, is it? I'm, I'm sorry? I said then you could hardly call that a long-term agreement. Well, it is. By, by the standards, it's uh, 30 days and over. So we, we renew on a 30-day basis. M my personal impression is a month without us going down there is too long. I'd rather be down there every other, you know, week uh, in, or here. I'm just here. We're, moved we're to Nashville. Nashville. Great place. <laughs> i got to finish my job up in Paris first. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, in anticipation of the board's first question to staff, and while the appellant is still at the table, I'll note, to the extent this is a non-owner occupied property, which based on the testimony, it unquestionably is, uh, you're going to ask me about the pending legislation 2017-608 and whether or not an R10 zone property would ultimately be eligible for a non-owner occupied permit under the existing law. The answer, of course, is no. Um, just say if you haven't asked that question, because I know it'll be relevant. And while the appellant's still at the table, in case you have any other questions of them, I thought it would be good to put that in now. Well, we're, I'm reading in the um, board packet, we got opposition letters, and they're noting, and I guess they'll come up and speak as well, that this was applied for as a type one owner occupied. Can you address that? Th that is correct. And that's that's what we intend to do intend to do or have done well that's we haven't obtained the permit yet so that when we if we're if we're allowed to get the permit it will be a type one because his wife would be spending you know two weeks out of the month every every month in nashville as well as him but you wouldn't be living here all the time or you said she well, would be here two weeks and then he would be here two weeks that'd be a question alternate for two weeks no no 
No, no, we would be down together. She would be here more than I would. She, the, her her schedule is a whole lot more flexible. Then the than other mine two is. or three weeks in the month, uh, you all neither one of you would be there. Then they could rent it. And that's that's where I would come into play representing the property. And I don't remember the rules that for owner occupancy. Well, yeah. Let me ask another question then. So, where's your home? Paris. Paris, T Tennessee. Okay. And so are you selling your home anytime or leaving Paris? I can't imagine I, we'd ever sell the home up in Paris. But that's where you live right now, right? Correct. And so you're going to Nashville would just be visiting this home. Agreed for now. Yes. So your driver's license is Paris, Tennessee on it? Your Tennessee driver's license on it? I, yes, agreed. I, I live in Paris. Okay. And are you going to change that anytime soon? His wife's was to be changed to that address. But is she moving to Nashville or is she staying in Paris? She'll probably be moving a lot sooner than I would. When would that be? We don't know yet. I mean, are we talking she's, well, weeks, she's got a, months, years? She's got a business up there, too. It really depends on when the business sells. But are we talking weeks, months, years? I can't imagine it would be weeks or months. Okay. So I see where you're going, and I think, and I don't remember, I know they have to show all this, um, you know, driver's license and where they get their mail, and so I, I don't know if this is an owner-occupied situation. R respectfully, Ms. Carpenter, it's good news that you don't have to know. Ultimately, you have to decide whether or not uh, the stoning staff erred by denying the permit application, um, and then you have to determine what to do about it in terms of how long they're required to wait. Staff, administratively, will have to make the determination in conjunction with the ordinance as to whether or not they meet the criteria for an owner-occupied permit or whether they are, in fact, a non-owner-occupied applicant. Um, and there are criteria specifically identified in the ordinance. You touched on driver's license as one example, voter registration is one example, uh, bank statements demonstrating home address I know is one example, and there are others included as well. Famously, utility bills are not an example of what's allowable to demonstrate owner-occupied status. However, that is fortunately for the board, not before the board as a fundamental question. So yes, this is an item A appeal, and as John Michael has pointed out, we are here to decide if the zoning administrator erred in his denial of the permit. So this is a contested case, so uh, do you have anything else to say before we hear from the other side? No, we'll just save a referral rebuttal. Okay. Uh, let's hear from the opposition then. You'll have 12 minutes and 35 seconds for rebuttal. So we're going to hear from the opposition. If you'd please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Gordon Phillips at 2425 Elliott, uh, so to one side of the contested property. James Short, 2421 Elliott, the other side of the property. Okay, so why are you all here today and um, why do you uh, think the zoning administrator did not make a mistake in denying the permit? So from the start, we have been pretty clear about our uh, lack of comfort and lack of enthusiasm with any short-term rental property. You know, to us, these are homes very close to each other, probably 10 to 15 feet apart. Um, back porches, you know, essentially cr almost create the feeling of a, a undisturbed uh, four, you know, four sets of properties next to each other. Um, we feel that short-term renters come in with very different sets of priorities, will treat the property very differently, and our relationship to them is fundamentally short-term in nature. Um, we, uh, we made this very clear. We were told uh, in text messages uh, that I brought a copy of um, that this was only going to be used one week, uh, one day, or one weekend a month at most. Uh, so from Wendell, he plans to rent it maybe once a month, if that. I will have a permit in a couple of weeks if everything goes smoothly. Um, 
this was not the case. You know, when they said they rented it about three times, that was probably three times, maybe within mon one month, maybe within a six week period. You know, this is something that, it, it is a part of town that everyone wants to live in, it's why we want to live in it. Um, so this is renting quite quickly. Um, we, we have two main issues, you know, one, I, is in them operating this without a permit uh, or before they had a permit. And the other is, as you noted, uh, in the type one nature of the permit they applied for. You know, the reason it is easier to get a type one permit is that uh, you, as someone who is living in this house most of the time, will bring in a different type of renter and have a different relationship with short-term renting services. You know, as they noted, uh, they do not occupy this property. And if they were somehow approved for this, I don't understand why anyone would ever go through the time and trouble of getting a type two, proper, type two permit um, if you don't have to, prior to applying, show that you occupy the residence. It, it wasn't as if this issue was not contested. I'm not Sorry, gonna- Please identify yourself for the record. Again, I'm, this is James Short, 2421 Elliott on the other side. Nope. My, our goal here is not to upset our neighbors and people that we believe to be owner occupied. Mm -hmm. But I think from the get-go, our communications have been mostly been with this real estate agent who's not here today, Wendell Sturdivant. Um, and the clear intention of this place that was made to us and the actions that have taken forth have suggested that this is mainly a short-term rental that they're going for. And upon that, I've, we've asked questions, we have documentation stating, hey, are you planning to rent this out? How often are you planning to do it? Just a lot of these types of questions. And we've gotten answers that allude to, you know, once, twice a month within, I think, the first week that they had Airbnb up, they had three or four renters in there. So it just, it comes across as the, most of the intent here was to short-term rent, and we also asked questions leading up before they started to short-term rent, what the situation was directly to the agent. Now, I can't speak for Mr. Lundberg um, and, and when they're gonna move here, and I, I don't certainly want to upset anybody, but we also want to have a house, and we want to have the people applying for the house next to us be honest with us about what the intention of they're actually doing and, and how often they're gonna rent it and, and those types of situations. So there's, we just, you know, that those are the main issues. And Okay, so the permit was revoked. Why is that uh, the proper decision to have revoked their permit? It, it, why, that, that's what we're here to that's discuss, what, right? Yes, that's why we're here today. So an it appears appeal. to me that they applied for a permit knowing that it's not, a, 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 at this juncture, it's not a type one permit. So that's number one, that's dishonesty in my opinion. Whether it was from him or it was from the real estate agent, that's a, they put it forth knowing that this is not going to be an owner-occupied house. They're not gonna live there six months out of the year. I understand what they're saying is the amount of time they intend to spend there, but I live on one side of the house, he lives on the other side of the house. I, I don't see them very often, and we're there all the time. So to be clear, maybe one to two days a month on average from when I moved in in March uh, to the present, and you know, this is a relatively new build. No one was really staying there beforehand, so it's not as though anyone can point back, well, you know, a year ago we were treating this property differently. From what we understand from the zoning chief, we're not allowed to rule on the type one versus type two today, so um, maybe just focus on renting before they had the permit. Sure, and the other, the other piece of it is obviously there's very quickly been a second resident that's in the place right now under a six, seven week. I understand that's within the realm of long-term renting, but that is actually in my eyes, and I'm not sure how you guys view it, it's a short-term rental. So um, those are the two main reasons I see, and those are the reasons I guess that are most applicable to you, it sounds like. So that's I, why we feel that way. I guess the other thing I'd add is that if one can get around renting early by simply hiring someone else, and if things go poorly, blaming them, I think overturning this would create a loophole for essentially anyone to start renting early, and if they get caught, they can you know, get out of it. I'm very sympathetic to your uh, position on that. We've had a lot of struggle with this uh, short-term rental property legislation. And even though some years, a couple of years have passed, we still are dealing with some of the aftermath of that. Can you tell me, have there been specific issues with any of the persons in the property? You can go ahead if you want. Um, 
so yeah, there is, there's essentially a garage in back and parking spaces to the side that go horizontal uh, to, the, to the parking. Um, mine essentially abuts uh, the one for this property. Uh, yeah, there have been times where the person has parked too far over and so I cannot fully pull back into mine. You know, again, the short-term nature of it, they might not, uh, well, you should be able to see visually how that would impact my use of my property, uh, but because they're short-term renters, uh, yeah, they have no reason uh, to care what we feel. Um, it's true, you know, within the property, there have not been you know, what we believe to be loud parties, but you know, it's tended to be rented to people who are looking to go out for the evening. You know, coming in, they're gonna be loud. Going out, they're gonna be loud. And uh, you know, this is essentially all happening you know, right outside our windows. Um, so it is a nuisance. Uh, yeah, there's a shared driveway um, between James's property and this property. You know, Again, they should be able to see that parking in the middle of that prohibits uh, cars from moving down, and yet, you know, sometimes we've seen people doing that. Um, I can't say I've had any major issues with the residents, I, but again, there's only been three short-term rentals, right? And so I think with having experience in the, like in this particular realm, I've encountered a lot of short-term rentals in my time in Nashville, and it's tough to predict what any people are going to do for behavior-wise. I mean, I don't know how you can screen that. But I can tell you that I have I had a gathering over at my place. We had about eight or nine people on the back porch. We were watching the hockey game for the playoffs. Um, we had a, a couple kids there, and we did notice that there was a distinct smell coming from the other side of the porch, um, which was marijuana. Um, comfortable enough to smoke weed on the back porch when we have kids outside is something that when I have kids at my place, and if that happened with a short-term renter, that's going to evoke a pretty strong reaction from me if, as a father, and it, recorded, it evoked a pretty strong reaction from the, the guests that we had over at the time. So that's the most distinct thing I can think of. How would you handle that? Um, politely walked across, told them that's, that's probably not a cool thing to do. We have kids here. I mean, we didn't, I'm not going to knee-jerk react. We're still neighbors, I mean, but, you know, take, take notice of what's going on around you. And, again, the proximity from one house to the next, from his to mine, it's very, very close. Talking distance, the way I'm speaking to you right now, you guys can hear the clear and, and see everything going on. So we want it to be a respectful neighborhood, and it's it's very much like a small miniature HOA. And so that's why we have we have three houses or four houses in this. We'd ideally like everyone that we have in that same realm to be like-minded in that in that respect. Um, so you didn't file a formal complaint with the police or Metro Codes or? No, I should have. So. And I understand what you're saying. I mean, I could come up with any kind of story or, or say anything without having any relative proof, but I can tell you that I don't have a large amount of reason to lie to you right now. Um, I'm not, and if you I'm need, not suggesting No, no, and, I, and, I, and there's other people that if I ever needed to have them come and speak to anyone, I could certainly do that, including my fiance and, and soon-to-be wife. <clears throat> any other questions? I wanted to get clarification on, um, probably from John on, what constitutes a long-term rental? Is it anything 30 days and over? So forgive a converse answer. A short-term rental is specifically defined by the ordinance and it's 30 days or less. If you have for interest to stay 30 days or less, that requires a permit. Beyond that, it does not require a permit. So sometimes we fall into this language of 31 days, doesn't sound very long, not a defined term. What is defined is short, 30 days or less. And will we be hearing from um, Mr. Osborne? Mr. Osborne is here, he's available, he has some information with regard to this case, maybe not as much with regard to alleged violations as this was not a permitted property that would have been on his radar as immediately, but he is present and can come forward. Might be helpful for him to review the process um, since they have complaints of how that gets yes. handled with and I think that's very helpful for not only this particular case, but other cases too. So, Mr. Osborne, the enforcer. Your life has been busy lately. Very much so. So if someone, let's say if I live next to an Airbnb or, and I have a complaint, what should I do? <coughs> they just went over to the neighbor and said, hey, just knock it off. But who should you call if you really? Um, you should call codes or there is a. What if it's like 2 o'clock in the morning, you're not going to get anyone. There, so. There's an online form they can fill out and submit a complaint anonymously that will be directed to me. 
Okay. So if you go to the Metro, what website do you go to to get this? Yes. The uh, Metro website, Nashville.gov? Yes, sir. Okay. And look for codes. And so you could fill out an anonymous complaint, comes to you, you investigate it. Correct. And you keep track of it by every single address. And I guess you also look to see if they're really licensed, too. Correct. That's the first thing I do is to, to see if they're licensed. Um, most complaints generally provide me with a link. If not, I'll have to go and search the uh, Airbnb, VRBO, and the other advertisements. How many yeah. emails do you get a week? I don't keep count. Is it over 50? I couldn't tell you. It's a lot. Okay. So what do you wish that the average person that sends you an email includes that some people don't? Um, most people do include the, the address and the link. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that speeds things up quite a but bit. But like information, do they need pictures? What do they need? Um, well, that's all they need to get me started. Okay. Um, if they want to provide more information, that's great, but we need them to testify um, with that information. Getting back to this particular case, what kind of knowledge do you have about uh, this particular house? And and I, I'm assuming you might have been the one that, I guess, kind of notified them about this. Yes, sir. So on June 15th, I printed out the adver advertisement and went to the property and I posted a stop work order. Um, at the time, they only had one review. Um, and then I also sent a citation. I visited this site on the June so, 19th. So you visit the site, and that's when you put the notice on the door? Yes, And sir. they also get something in the mail? Yes. Okay. But I sent the citation. It came back returned, at which point I filed a warrant. Um, I believe that Mr. Lumberg or Mr. Shield contacted me as well as uh, James. James, yes. So and kind of laid out the process to them at the time that you know, we were pursuing this in court, um, what the options were for Mr. Shields. Um, told them that you know, we were proceeding with, with the BZA before we proceeded with court to see what y'all would do. Questions? Thank you for being here, and thank you for probably being overworked than more than most. I'm sure we'll see you in the future. Thank you. I guess related to that, I have one more thing to pass out, and that's a heat map uh, from the Tennessean.com, essentially uh, showing. Explain that to people that don't know what a heat map is and what Absolutely. the Tennessean recently did. Uh, so some some nerd at the Tennessean <laughs> uh, coded in all the data from all the complaints, uh, and uh, on the map, white is places where there have not com been complaints. Red uh, are places where there have been the most complaints, and gradients of color in between uh, represent decreasing levels uh, of complaints. Uh, what you'll see is that essentially the reddest part of the map in this part of town uh, is basically our neighborhood. Um, so this is a problem that's affecting the neighborhood and uh, a short-term rental here is more likely to draw complaints than short-term rentals in some other parts of town. Why is that? Because we, your, your proximity to downtown? So or? I believe that it's the dual proximity 212 South, which is an attractive part of town mm -hmm. for people coming in from out of town. However, mm -hmm. this neighborhood is extraordinarily residential. So you have people coming on a short-term basis, being in close proximity with you know, a lot of young families, and I think it leads uh, to the sort of frictions that draw complaints. And it's also close to downtown. It's a five-minute, six-minute Uber lift to downtown, so it gives you the option to have a three- or four-bedroom house, staying in a bachelor party, and then you're staying in a, a, an area where there's a lot of families and young families and things like that. So that's probably my best guess on why it's that way. Any other questions for the opposition? Thank you. Did you speak to your council person? I understand he wrote us a letter, but I don't actually have that letter. No, but I, I, again, I was probably lack of just, I didn't understand who I should be speaking to or how to get to them. It's kind of the same situation with codes, and when you have a complaint, I'm not sure the best way to, to file it. So. so we'd spoken to, when this was an emerging issue, we spoke to our city councilman just to gain clarity on it. Uh, he said that he, a lot of his time is spent with short-term rental uh, type complaints, and so he might be monitoring this independently, uh, but neither James nor I spoke to him. Um, can we get a copy of the correspondence? 
trying to see if I can pull it up, actually, since it was received later in the day. When we say correspondence, that's a bit august. It was a sentence in a quick email, having been made aware of this kind of late in the process. He just emailed to say that he opposed the case. Um, if I may read it to the board, the exact sentence is, John, I won't be able to make it today, but please indicate to the board that I'm against this appeal, Colby. And that, of course, is Councilmember Colby Sledge. Okay, anything else to add? We appreciate you all being here today. Thank We're you, guys. we hear from the original applicant. Again, come back. Oh, sorry, before they come up, is, did you? Oh, yes, they have more opposition, yeah. so. Sorry, I just have a couple words. Please come forward and um, speak on the merits of this particular case. I, I shall. Uh, my name Press is Omid. button. Very good. My name is Omid Yamini. I live at 1204 North 2nd Street in Nashville, Tennessee, 37207. Um, my timing is not very good because I actually missed the very beginning of this case, um, so I'll have to go back and watch the video. But uh, do, I, do I understand that uh, Mr. Shields is representing the lease killers? Oh, okay. Yeah, because I was reading this article that you had written on the on the lease killers about. Of course, how it's appropriate to address the board at the board hearing. Okay, yeah. I apologize. Um, but the lease killers is a company that's based out of my neighborhood. Actually, I believe but they're not in front of us today. So. Oh, that's fine. No, I was just curious uh, if that had come up at the beginning. Uh, to me, again, I, I just wanted to speak on this. Um, to state that you know I'm, I'm hearing a lot of discussion about the different types of STRs, and I'm glad that you all are investigating that. Uh, as we heard, that's not really why we're here, and I guess that's not what your board is going to decide. But um, it sounded like Mr. Osborne stated that they had been operating without a permit, and uh, that is essentially grounds for at least a one-year injunction, I believe. Speak to us about, you know, because obviously that's the maximum penalty. Why does this case deserve the maximum penalty in your opinion? <clears throat> Again, the fact that uh, if, if this gentleman, Mr. Shields, was involved from the very beginning, um, he runs a company that essentially, uh, again, writes articles and knows about all short-term rental law in Nashville, Tennessee. So I have a hard time understanding why they were operating well, without a permit. Before you came, there was another agent who apparently was the one that misidentified whether they had a permit or not. Okay. Well, I guess whatever the case may be, they operated without a permit. Again, there's, there's always going to be, they've always got reasons, right? I've been here and I've heard a lot of cases and they've always got a reason. You know, I didn't know, I don't watch the news, I don't do this, I don't... Um, in this case, they live in Paris, Tennessee, and they bought a house to use as a hotel here. And I, I thank the other members of the community that stepped forward today to speak on that. Um, I, I don't, again, there's, there's always going to be a reason, right? But the fact is, they didn't follow the rules. They operated without a permit. And that's, again, what I'm asking you to uphold. Okay. Any questions? Thank you for being here. Thank you. Anyone else speaking in opposition of this particular case? Oh, come back, applicant. So this is rebuttal time, so you could respond to what you heard. First of all, I wasn't aware of any issues that had happened, and I'm very sympathetic of the neighbors, and I'm sorry that whatever had happened and um, happened, and had they had my phone number, I would have come over and resolved the issue immediately. Um, but my answer to that is, if I was to put a long-term tenant in there for a sign a year lease, um, and they were smoking marijuana every day, you can't get rid of them at that point. It's it's temporary on a short-term rental. You know what I mean? So well, under some leases, you actually right. can so, pick people out for drug use. Correct. Yeah, if you can, if you can, you know, prove that it was there exactly. You know, but that that's my thing is I, I am sympathetic toward that, and um, you know that's why our, you know our properties we have decimal readers, things of that not uh, things of that such, and you know we're not here just to put anybody and everybody in. You know what I mean? We we don't want to do that. We respect the neighbors. A lot of times I give my phone number to the neighbors. If you have a problem, you can call me at two o'clock in the morning, and I'll answer and come over there and handle whatever happens. I've done it, me or my team. There's plenty of us that work together. But as far as like, you know, the issues goes with, with, with why they don't want it, I'm not sure that that's 
afraid of having complaints. I'm not sure that that's why we're here. It's in order, it's, it's because we were operating without a permit in the beginning and why we shouldn't be allowed to have that. I think that's the issue on the table, but. Yes, that is why you're here. Right, but. So I, respond to that. Well, and like I was saying, I, I wasn't involved. There's any, any property that we've represented besides this one, we've never operated without a permit. We have always, we've always done that. that. And that's what I'm saying. This one did. Correct. And it was an outlier because there was a real estate agent that was involved pulling the permit. And then he had given the owner the green light that he had the permit, which in sense gave us the green light. We listed it, had three rentals there. And as soon as we found out, we turned it into a 30 day or over corporate rental or whatever you want to call it. And so that's, that's what I'm saying is uh, I've never, ever had this issue before, and I've always abided by the rules my company has as far as pulling permits and, and obtaining them and renting them, you know, at, well, after we had the permit. So that, that is just, you know, that's, that was our intention in the beginning. We were just given wrong information, so, and we apologize about that. Uh, questions, board members? I don't think there's any challenge today if, as to whether or not you are not doing what you're supposed to. The issue is against yes. the person that's not here. Yes. Correct. Correct. And it, we should have brought him here and, and, and whatnot, but we, we didn't even think that he would be involved in this because it, essentially I, I was the management company who listed it and, you know, he was, and he was the owner with the information. Well, talk about the management company list. What's your due diligence? I mean, you can go online and see if someone has a permit or not. You obviously didn't do that. Well, correct. Uh, yeah, we didn't. We we were just. We but you're said, a real estate. Company. Why didn't you do that? That takes 15 seconds. Like I said, it was an outlier. You know, generally we obtained the permit in the, in our hands before um, we had just been given the green light and and we listed it and you know that that was our fault. So um, we had just been given some wrong information and we should have acted on that appropriately and we didn't in that time so you know that 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 was on us it was just a complete miscommunication and it's it has never ever happened before okay. any, other, any other questions well have you changed your policies accordingly so that it doesn't occur again correct we have it was uh it was a mistake that we never want to make again because you know sending 180 letters out to you know is, is not fun you know saying so, nobody wants to do that and we don't want to upset neighbors and anything like that we always want to be respectful uh of of the outlying uh homes and uh, we have changed our policy to obtain and and put the permit in the picture appropriately like in the listing as you should there have been a number of questions asked today about his wife moving in whenever that would be. They have not been answered. Yeah, and and the reason what they were saying is they, they haven't seen, you know, you know, the family over there. It's because, you know, from my assumption that you guys were traveling in the beginning, um, and then as soon as we found out to make up for cash flow, I put a long term tenant in there or I put an over thirty day tenant in there to gain some of the cash flow back until the appeals and we could find out if we could continue operating how we intend, intended to operate. Um, I just was I presented him with an idea for a corporate rental to gain some of the, the uh, cash flow back. I, I stopped Wendy from going down there when all this happened because I didn't want anything else to go wrong with the house. And, you know, he decided, well, let's just put it up on long term, which is fine because we weren't going to go down there until. Uh, as far as moving down there. you have there, the right to go to a house that you bought. Absolutely. At, at so that, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about today, except maybe the type of permit that you're applying for, whether you're there or not. Right. You that, could go at any time. You don't have to stay away from the house because we are talking about it. Yeah, True. yeah and I, that, but that, that's where I, I had told him that I was just going to go ahead and put a corporate rental in there for him, so just to make up for the cash flow. Any questions from the board? Do you have anything else to add? I do not. Okay, we're going to close the public hearing. Time for discussion. I'll start off by saying this. Um, we've had a lot of these cases over the time that the council has passed this law and also relaxed our authority to um, less than a year punishment for certain cases. So under the old rules, you know, if we had found this person guilty, they would have to stay out for a year. 
I would challenge the board to kind of look at this case and look at what we heard today and determine A, is the zoning administrator correct? And if we do find him correct and we come up with a uh, term that the permit should not be allowed, what is that term? Well, I think we have to consider that this may or may not be eligible, this property may or may not be eligible for an owner-occupied permit, and we don't need to be talking about that because we don't make that decision. Right, we're here to so, determine but that has to, the I zoning think, administrator was correct or not. Right, today. But, but I think that, that that issue has to be considered before we talk about when you can reapply because we don't even know if they can reapply for the same kind of permit that they originally applied for. So I do think we have to take that into some consideration. Mr. Chairman, um, this is an item A appeal. Um, and um, the testimony that I heard today um, indicated that um, the applicant does not reside there. This is an owner-occupied permit is what they have applied for. The testimony I heard is, is that they reside in Paris. Um, you can only have one residence. And I find it um, very concerning that, um, that they've applied as an owner-occupied, and that doesn't seem to be substantiated by the um, testimony that we've heard today. In that case, uh, Mr. Herbert, Regardless of our decision, we, if we determine that, the, that you did not err and we set a term from when they can reapply, those are fa they reapply as a new permit, and those are facts that you can at that time when you take the application take into consideration the type of permit they seek. Is that right? That is correct. Well, oh, go ahead. Well, I was and let say me say this, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but um, as this board probably knows under the, under the current pending legislation of Bill 608, we are not allowed to issue non-owner occupied type twos. We do not issue those currently. Here's my thought, taking into account what Mr. Herbert has said and the testimony we've heard here today from the applicant as well as the opposition. Uh, you know, we've had these situations early on where we've had a homeowner come in and say, I relied on my management company, and the management company came in uh, to their credit to say this was our fault, and the policy has been changed uh, to avoid that in the future. Because all we're dealing with is whether or not there was an error at the time the application was approved, uh, and again, because of the complaints that we had, it seems to me that this would be a case where we would find that the zoning administrator, I might propose that we find the zoning administrator did not err, but that we would ask for 90 days, that's 30 days for each rental that occurred as taking into consideration the complaints until they can reapply. And all that means is they can reapply for an appropriate permit at that time. I feel a little differently. I think they knew what, where they were living. They, were, they had real estate professionals all around them. And I think 30, uh, 90 days is way too late. I really do. These were people that consulted people in the real estate business that do this and that we make it easy as a city that you can look and see if you have a permit or not. When you say way too late, what? Light. 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 Thank you. What do you propose? I say six months. I'm not going to argue. What do other board members think? I agree with you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Well, I make a motion that we uh, uphold the zoning administrator's uh, um, denying their permit and that the, we restrict this applicant and this address from having a short-term rental permit of any kind for six months. I'll second. Or unless you reapply then. No. Okay. No. Just okay. six months. May I ask the board a question? No. Okay. 
motion's been made. Did anyone second it? I'll second. Okay, it's been properly seconded. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion? Signif yes. Uh -huh. Oh, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is case number 2017-214. This is another item A case involving a short-term rental property. This one, the property located at 1809 Lincoya Bay Drive. The appellant and owner of the property is Nicholas Hollenbeck. Mr. Hollenbeck is present. Please come forward to make your presentation to the board. Uh, this too was a case where the application was denied based upon prior operation before first obtaining the legally required permit. Um, tax assessor photography of the subject property, aerial of the property where it backs over by the lake. And once again, Mr. Osborne is present if the board has any specific questions of him once the presentation is made. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 214? Seeing no hands, the appellant will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Please introduce yourselves by name and address, and address the board. Hi, I'm Nicholas Hollenbeck. I preside at 1809 Lingoya Bay Drive. Members of the BZA, thank you for hearing my case. On July 5th, 2017, I had my friend Enoch over for dinner. While I was cooking dinner, Enoch suggested that I Airbnb my condo on the weekends while I travel out of town for work. I had never considered this idea until that night. He had, he had his computer open and in front of him and asked me if he would like me to set up set your, his, my account up for, for me. After little consideration and being a primary custodial parent of two boys, I told him, let's do it. So he set up the whole thing, listed and had my condo listed while I was cooking dinner. That being said, Enoch and I completely were unaware of any permitting laws. On the next day, July 6th, I had several bookings already. One being on Saturday, July 8th, which was two days later. Um, everything was happening so fast, so I just started getting my place ready for my first guest. Um, on Friday, July 7th, I went down to the Homeowners Association office to make sure that I wasn't violating any laws and, and still was unaware of any permitting laws by the state and was not told by the property manager that I had, but had gotten a signed affidavit saying that I wasn't violating any HOA laws. My first, my first guest stayed Saturday, July 8th, the next day, and everything went really well. On Sunday, July 9th, I told my neighbor about the new Airbnb venture, and he had asked if I had gotten my permit to do it. I asked him what he was talking about, and he told me that he read something about needing a permit for short-term rentals. So I looked into it and found the requirements to apply for the permit. The next day, I got every paper needed to apply for the permit, but my insurance. The insurance was put in place as a verbal agreement, but had to go through an underwriting company through an umbrella company. Uh, this process took over a week to complete. Um, on Friday, July 14th, I received a notice on my door to not proceed with STRP. I called the number on the sign and realized what had happened and I canceled all my future appointments and froze my Airbnb account. You say froze, you didn't delete it? Well, you, I don't think that you can delete it. They, they, it's an unlisted, unactive, I guess. I, I, I communicated with uh, Airbnb and I have those communications. And uh, what did you ask them when you communicated with them? What well, you I basically to told them what had happened mm -hmm. um, and I told them that Which I Which was what? What did you say? You, like you had a listing without a permit? Yes. No, I told them that I had received a notice on my door mm -hmm. that said, do not proceed. And what did Airbnb say? They said, let's see. Um, so the case manager, Shelby, and I can give this to you if you want. Um, I'm, I'm contacting regarding the reservation. Um, 
I've gone ahead and canceled your reservation since you cannot continue with it. I made sure to avoid any of the penalties associated with the cancellation as long as you provide me with documentation of your citation stating you cannot host the Airbnb. If you have any future reservations and need to cancel, please let me know. So it sounds like they just canceled the reservation, but then is, is, is this a current listing? If I'm no, on it, Airbnb right now, could, no, would I see it? No, sir. It was listed, uh, the, the site went up on July 5th mm -hmm. and was frozen on July 14th when I received the notice. Frozen meaning well, pulled down. You can't on, see it. It's like yeah, it's you not can't. There. It's not active. There's no like. I still like everything wasn't completely deleted. The whole account. There's still an account there with with the information that I have entered into it. That can that anyone entered. see that but you? Nobody can see it but me. There's no listing. Okay. We have about ten letters of opposition. About five letters of support. Why okay. do you think so many people have written letters to oppose this? Um. I just think that I'm the first case, maybe the, the in our neighborhood, to to try an Airbnb or short-term rental, and that people weren't quite aware of of short-term rentals, and they just don't want that in the neighborhood. And do you see what, where they're coming from and their dislike of this? Um, I thing? do and I don't. The reason that I do see that is that there, our units are close to each other. We have, uh, there's four units in one building and some of the properties, uh, some are single, some are just two. Um, in my case right there in that picture, there's four units. I'm the middle of four. Um, towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, so I can see where they would be worried about noise problems maybe. Um, the thing that I don't understand is that there's long-term rentals in the neighborhood that we've had multiple issues with. We've had to call the police on every night. We've had to have removed from the neighborhood. Um, with a short-term rental, I just, I think that there's more control than long-term for the fact that you can go through the process that Airbnb has and scan people and accept people before they can rent. Um, there's two different ways to do it. You can accept a person or you can just open it up for anybody to rent your property. I had mine set to where I would want to talk to the person, review them, uh, and and accept them to rent. Um, I what, also, what is nextdoor.com? Nextdoor. Oh, that's that is our neighborhood. So that's the neighborhood app that a lot of people use in communities mm -hmm. to communicate when there's things that are going on. So apparently, one of the people said that you were on Nextdoor.com, kind of promoting this property. No, sir, I was not. Um, somebody had uh, initially uh, posted on Nextdoor.com when they got the letter in the mail. Mm -hmm. um, I had to send a hundred. I had to stuff and send 119 letters to yep. my six, my neighbors within 600 feet. Once they received that letter, there was a post posted on Nextdoor explaining everything did that was going on. Did you respond to that post? Yes, I did. And what did you say? Well, basically, the, what, what that they had commented was not right because they had read the paper wrong. They thought that this was an appeal for the entire neighborhood, not just but, for one but unit. But did you say you were doing this to make money, I guess? That's what the yes, I was, I, I was doing it to make extra money for my children on okay. the weekends, yes. Well, let me read to you. Can I, can I just say one sure. thing? Mm -hmm. A lot of these letters reference 1730 mm -hmm. Lincoya Bay Drive, but his ad address is 1809? I'm 1809, yes. So I don't know if... Well, I'm reading one that represents 1809 that Lincoya Bay Drive. Okay. It's from Heather Gardner. And she says, I know Mr. Hollenbeck has mentioned on nextdoor.com that he wants to use his home as a short-term rental property to make money. Well, as a school teacher, I understand the struggle of needing a 12-month salary. I teach 10 months a year for Metro Public Schools, and I'm paid for 10 months. The six weeks I'm out on the summer leave, I must teach summer school, scrub toilets, sell makeup or lotion, or even coax at the baseball stadium. What we must do is keep our roofs over our heads as long as it doesn't disrupt the peace of our neighbors. So many neighbors have, have moved, leaving their properties in the care of rude, loud, careless renters who have no investment in our community. And so she include, includes by saying, our sanctuary has been robbed. Please do not steal the rest of our peace. How do you respond to that, your well, neighbor? 
Uh, my response would be that all of those properties that she's referring to were long-term rentals. Mm -hmm. So we haven't had any short-term rentals in our pro in our neighborhood that I'm aware of. Right. And so I'm, I, I can see where she's coming from. I'm working two jobs. I work seven days a week in the spring and fall. I work seven days and I'm a single parent with two children and I'm just trying to make ends meet. I'm, I'm trying to make a little extra money. So when I'm on, on the weekends, when I'm traveling to work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I was gonna open my home up to have an owner occupied Airbnb to make a little bit of extra income just to help pay for things for my children. So when you pulled up the posting, my understanding is now there's something that says, hey, your local community might have some rules or regulations about listing. You should check with them before you fill out this form or post a property. You didn't see anything like that? Uh, I didn't, but I did go to the board meeting mm -hmm. that was prior to me doing the listing, and it was told that that we were allowed to Airbnb or short-term rentals, have short-term rentals in our, pro in our property, because the bylaws that were created were put in place before any of this. So this came up at a, a homeowners association board meeting? Yes. And they didn't say, oh, and by the way, you have to get a license to do this. No, they did not. No. That's just shocking. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also just in my defense that, you know, there was a, a on August 5th there uh, on Fox News, they did a report and I'm sure you all are aware of it, that there's 5,600 listed Airbnbs in, in Nashville and only 2,600 of, the, of them have, or there's only 2,600 permits that have been issued. So my point is, is that do 3,000 people really understand the laws and are they doing it illegally or are we just unaware? Because these sites don't allow or they don't, um, they don't require you to have a permit in order to sign up. They don't even tell you. Okay. Um, May I ask a question? Um, I see you have a letter from a neighbor named Johnny Hanks that's supporting your request. And he says that you've been a good neighbor by organizing community cleanup days through Nextdoor Neighborhood App. How long have you lived in that community? Um, I'm an original owner. The, 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 the entire community was built in 2005. Oh, my unit was built in 2006. I there. I remember the, watching it go up. Yeah, so my unit was built in 2006. I bought it pre-construction. Um, I've been an active member of the community trying to organize, you know, lake cleanup. If you see, there's the lake right there. There's all kinds of garbage all around there. Um, and that's why I was using the neighborhood app, was one of those reasonings. Um, and and you know, I'm just, I, I'm always keeping an eye on our garbage because there's, there's a garbage directly across from my unit that people leave just like furniture and all kinds of stuff there. And I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to help the community out to keep it clean. And, and you know, I have, the neighbors are my best interest and always have been. Well, can we check if we go on your site, you said you would continue to have it listed so that you have to uh, interview or check on the people who are asking to rent. Can we find out if you would continue to do that? Were we to recommend that you be allowed to reapply? Yes. Thank you. Can we hear from Mr. Osborne again? Come forward. So, um, I'm gonna ask you some cases, some, some information about listing on Airbnb. So, in the last three months, six months, if you just go to the Airbnb website, is there any information about if you enter a national zip code, do they tell you about any sort of rules or local things that you should check into before you post? It's under the uh, frequently asked questions. Uh, they tell you to kind of look into your local jurisdiction. But it's not under are. something that if you just put a national zip code, it just automatically pops up and says, whoa, wait a minute, you gotta, you're trying to do it in Nashville, why don't you? Not, not to my knowledge. I haven't tried to post one, right. but you know, I search it actively and I haven't had a pop-up saying something like that. But I have looked on there to see that there is, some, there is information in there telling you to look into your local government to see what their ordinances are. Okay, any other questions? I do. Are there any complaints against this particular unit? Because a lot of the opposition is opposing another unit in this development. Um, this was a complaint that was sent to us. Um, there are other complaints in the area, I think of at least three, maybe four. But a, a complaint with um, noise or? Just not having a permit. 
that's the only complaint. So not Correct. disturbance of the neighbors. Uh, not to my knowledge. Okay, thanks. Now that was for my unit or, or another unit? For your unit. It was just operating without permit. Yeah, okay. so no one, so that we have a lot of opposition letters complaining mm -hmm. about a different unit in your community and it was a um, little confusing reading. Okay. Is there any opposition here? Nope, it's just him. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Osborne? Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Do you have anything else to add? Um, no, I, I, I let you know everything that I had on here. Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing discussion, board members. I'm impressed that the applicant um, hasn't had any complaints about noise or drug use or disturbance in the neighborhood. All the letters that I read were simply, I don't want to be an Airbnb, period. And they didn't really address this particular property. And um, I did read the letters of both opposition and support. And I feel like this person appears to be a good neighbor to his neighbors. And I don't know that there is a way to check and see that he continues to interview or do some kind of checking on people who want to rent, but he has said that he would, and we need to take him at his word. I don't think the administrator has uh, erred in denying this, but I think that this person has complied once he heard that, once he got the notice on his door, he took his the ability to rent that place down. So I think we could probably uh, use our newfound shorter terms to probably help him. I agree with you, and if you are willing to make a motion, if no one else has comments, I would second it. Then I will make that motion that the zoning administrator did not err in denying the permit and that we uh, shorten the length of time and not make this uh, applicant wait a year, but that um, since this, they have not been able to rent since July, and this is September, that we allow him to reapply for a permit. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye, opposed, passes unanimously. Now, you still have to go apply and go through all the hoops, yes, so sir. you know you're not to list or even post or advertise until you get your proper permits. Absolutely, and I have all my papers ready right now, so. Okay. Thank you very much. Very good. Yep, John Michael, short break. Board needs to take a short break. We'll reconvene in about five minutes. The request is for a variance from front and side setback requirements in the MULA district in order to install a ground sign for the commercial development that is now underway, as shown here under construction uh, in the aerial map. The signage for the tenant in this space would require reductions in setback on the side from 25 down to 10 feet, and from the front on the front side from 10 down to 5 feet. From our recent site visit, the subject property shown here on the lower right-hand corner and across the street to the upper left. The views up and down Charlotte at that location. This is the, I guess, north side of Charlotte Avenue, uh, lower right-hand corner looking outbound, upper left-hand corner and uphill looking inbound. Uh, is there anyone here in opposition to case number 215? Seeing none, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Please introduce yourself by name and address and proceed. Yes, good afternoon. Carl Bell, A1 Signs, 1441 Highway 96, Burns, Tennessee. 37209, excuse me, 37029. Okay. I'm here representing the, uh, the property owners on the building and the signage. Uh, Will Tyner with Commercial Realty Services with a property developer and owner, uh, 5000 Crossing Circle, Mount Juliet, Tennessee. Okay, so why do you need a variance for the setbacks to put up this sign? If you can see by, if you can see by the picture, it's a really tight uh, property 
we had to move the building up in order to, like, uh, we will probably could answer that question better than I can. I'll let him do it. Okay, so the overall design of the site was the desired urban streetscape with a building fronting uh, on Charlotte with sidewalk, uh, landscape strip. Um, as you can see, um, the shape of the site is quite irregular. It's basically a triangle, so there's there's a irregular amount of frontage on Charlotte versus the size of the site. It's only 0.8 acres. Um, the amount of frontage dictates the side setback from a signage perspective. Um, there's a total of, I think, 209 feet in frontage, uh, and that puts us over the 200 mark, which creates the 25-foot side setback. Um, we're, we've limited to one access point into the site, um, and so I think that there was a site plan that, that showed the, the building and the entrance, and they really only have one other spot that we we're able to locate the sign, um, and it's within the um, setback. Okay. Is your lot, it's this triangular shape lot? It's the triangular shape, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, anything else to add? Just if we were if we were under 200 feet, the setback would be 10 feet instead of 25 or 10 foot longer than that put us over the, the side. That's why you're here in front of us. Yes, sir. Because Thank of you. the shape of the lot. Okay. Yes, sir. Gotcha, okay. Close the public hearing. Discussion? Well, it seems like it, it meets the hardship definition. Uh, it is a regular shape, and I'd be willing to support the appeal. John Michael, have we heard from the council person on this? I'm aware that the council member reviewed the case and had asked a couple of questions, but did not chime in with specific support or opposition at this point. Okay. Anyone want to make a motion? Uh, I'll move that we grant the variance uh, and we find that the hardship is the irregular shape of the lot. Okay. I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you for your time. Mr. Chairman, the next case for the board is 2017-217. Kitty Orlovsky is the appellant and owner of the property at 3228 Holbrook Drive in Council District Number 16. The request is an item A appeal associated with a short-term rental permit, the permit application denied by staff based upon prior operation at the subject location. The aerial shown here gives an indication of the home, which you can see from the zoning map is right up against Glencliff High School. Face of the property here. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 217? Seeing no one, Ms. Orlovsky, please introduce yourself by name and address and make the desired presentation to the board. Yes, hi, my name is Katie Orlovsky. I live at 3228 Holbrook, Holbrook Drive, 37211 in the 16 district. Uh, my council member is uh, Mike Freeman. Uh, thank you, first off, for your time and dedication to the integrity of the city of Nashville. Um, I'm appealing the denial of an owner-occupied short-term rental permit. I did begin to host before I was aware of the need for a permit. Uh, similar to Mr. Hollenbeck's case. Um, I deactivated the count as soon as I became aware for the need to apply for a permit, for which I did and was denied. Um, for a little bit of timeline, I heard about this from a friend. I thought that sound, sounds like a great idea, a good way to earn a little extra income. Uh, it's technically a four bedroom house, but only two are actually bedrooms, other storage. Um, I applied on Airbnb and listed my home, uh, one room in my home uh, that I do live in full time, 365 days a year. I listed it on July 4th, had a booking promptly at 8 a.m. on July 5th. Um, that guest, one female, arrived on the 9th of July, and I learned about a permit uh, need on the 17th. How did, just you, in, how did you learn about yeah, that? Yeah, just in talking to a friend of mine, I similar also to Mr. Hollenbach, said, hey, yeah, like, I know you, I heard you listed your house, and I thought that might be a good idea, so I listed mine, and they said, yeah, did you get your permit? And I said, 
Uh, no, I, d I didn't. What? So I immediately deactivated my account. That was on uh, the 17th. I work the next few days. I'm a nurse at a hospital, so 12-hour shifts don't really leave me with a whole lot of time to uh, come to to the Metro uh, Codes office. But I came on the 20th, uh, applied for a permit, was denied. Um, and when you applied for the permit, did they ask you? Of course, and I, yes, and I was honest, um, and I knew I was fully aware that I was probably going to be denied, but I still came down and, and went forth with it. I spoke to all my neighbors um, immediately surrounding my home and got uh, written approval of their blessing to list the one room in my home. Um, I am i don't want to be the people that you see on the TV that are not living in their home and neighbors, similar to the case that we've heard today. I don't want my neighbors to be complaining. I've lived in this house since um, early 2013. Uh, shortly after I moved to Nashville, I promptly bought a home because this is where I intend to stay. Um, this is my home, and I am... Uh, it's important to me to be in good faith and good standing with my neighbors because I'm friends with my neighbors. These are people that I can ask to do anything for me if I need anything, if I'm out of town. They're the ones watching my home for me and people that I trust and I never want to do anything um, to wrong them. So I guess I'm here asking for your forgiveness and uh, clemency on this matter. If I have to wait the, um, the required year for a permit, I will absolutely do so. But um, I'm here in hopes that I I am able to uh, obtain that permit. First of all, we appreciate your honesty. And these are cases that we hear, you know, we used to hear more of these kind of cases, but that people basically heard about from someone else and then went down with their application and they're kind of immediately asked, well, have you rented before? And then you say yes and then denied yeah. for a year. So, um, it sounds like, and so it sounds like there's nobody in opposition. You rented it once and then you took it down, right? Yeah. And the listing's down right now. Listing is also same as Mr. Hollenbeck's case. It's deactivated. Mm -hmm. It's not deleted from Airbnb cloud. But if you were to go on Airbnb.com, it. it would not be there. No okay. one can see it. Any questions for the applicant? Thank you. We're going to close the public hearing. Thank you. So. Um, keep your seat. Keep your seat. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, I think that this is a case where someone didn't know the law, tried to do the right thing, immediately came down with an application in hand and was asked that question that Coates asked, if you've listed before, and she was honest, and of course the denial was based on that. So I move that we uphold the zoning administrator's ruling that uh, the applicant um, operated prior to getting a permit but I would suggest that we make her eligible immediately to participate in the short-term rental permit process. I'll second. Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. So what we've done is you're now eligible to take that application and apply for a owner-occupied <coughs> permit. And good luck, and thanks for being here. Great. Thank you all very much. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2017-219. This is a property located at 1305 Grand Avenue, just south of downtown in Council District Number 19. Gong Su is the appellant, Grand 7 Development, LLC, owner of the subject property. The request before you is for a variance from front setback requirements in this, the recently rezoned R6A zoning district, for the construction of a 3,500 square foot single family residence. The aerial here shows the property in its previous uh, condition before demolition and subsequent preparation for construction. The site plan gives a sense of the layout of the subject property as proposed. From my recent site visit, the view of the property, uh, what with its, obviously its BZA sign noticed uh, clear there in the middle of the property, the view across the street in the upper left-hand corner, and then the views up and down the street on Grand Avenue. The uh, front setback required here is 30 feet. The request is for a 10-foot front setback. Um, the appellant is present and will have the opportunity to come forward. Is there anyone here wishing to speak in opposition on case number 219? There are. Therefore, Mr. Sue will have uh, 15 minutes to make the desired presentation, and then we'll hear from the opposition. Uh, please come forward and introduce yourself by name and address. 
Mr. Chairman, I had Councilman O'Connell call me just a few minutes before this meeting. I asked him to send me an email. I think it's been passed around to you all. Yes, we have that. Thank you. And he was in opposition of this. Yes. Okay. Please proceed. Good afternoon. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Sigenthaler, and my address is 1496 uh, Woodmont Boulevard here in Nashville. Uh, I'm here as a uh, a land surveyor representing Mr. Uh, Hsu about this uh, proposition. I have a couple of uh, papers I'd like to pass out, but first I'd like to say that uh, changing this setback from the existing 30 feet uh, to 10 feet <clears throat> does three uh, things that we think are very uh, positive for the property and for the neighboring property. The first is, is if you're standing on the front porch looking out into the street, there's a condominium complex on the right and it's eight, the building there is eight feet from the right away of Grand Avenue. This is between, on Grand Avenue between 13th and the 14th. And um, so it's eight feet off of uh, the right of way. On the left is an existing house, the McDonald's home and it's 19 and a half feet from the right of way. So the request is to change this 30 foot setback, uh, which for years this house before its demolition was sitting 10 feet back behind the house on the, on the left. Uh, that house has been in, in front of this house. So the purpose in moving it forward, uh, the 10 feet is to change the parking uh, regime from the front yard, which would, which would be uh, uh, a requirement with a 30 foot uh, setback or that will provide the space for parking in the front. It will move the parking rather than in the front back to the back, to the backyard behind the house. Um, Another factor is, since these houses are staggered, uh, it would, by making one of them existing eight feet from the right of way, this house being 10 feet from the right of way, and the one on the left being 19 feet, they conform uh, more to the existing houses on either, si either side. Uh, I think the third factor is, this property, this subdivision was developed back in 1975, according to the recorded plat by the Metropolitan um, Housing Authority, a housing agency, it was a development and housing agency. And they developed these lots. And um, the property on the left, which is 19 feet back, their private sewer line uh, was put in that time and it comes across the, uh, this this uh, Mr. Shoes lot is existing, and it was put in uh, before these houses were were built, and it was put in because the existing sewer is another block away, further further uh, um, further down Grand Avenue. Actually, it's in 14th Avenue, so uh, Mr. Shoe has to accommodate that existing. Sewer, even though it does not uh, provide any sewer service for him, he's on he's on the existing sewer that's in the in the street in front of his property. So, uh, with that, if I could, I'd like to. While these pictures are good, I'd like to pass out a couple of things if that's permissible. Sure, bring them forward. All right. I had Please two, press the button if you're going to speak. Two sets here stapled together. Can I space them there? The, mm -hmm. the button. The first? Yes, and identify yourself for the record. Hi, yeah, uh, my name is uh, uh, Gong Yu Su. How do you uh, spell that? Gong Yu Su. Okay, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, from that picture, you probably can see it. There is a one, like a sewer line from my, from the property uh, I, I'm working on and uh, to the PVC pipe. Oh, can you wait a minute? Oh. So, you know, we don't need to have two people talking okay. at once. 
Okay, just pass them out and we're gonna hear from the applicant. Continue. Oh, okay, yeah, you can probably see that a PVC line. So that's like a service line to the, my neighbor, so. Mr. Chairman, if I may interrupt, it's gotta be a presentation to the board on the microphone. So with respect to Mr. Sigenthaler, any representation of the board, please do it on the mic or don't do it. We've gotta have it on record as a legal matter. Yes, we'll just pass these out and we'll, and then you can go back and, back and tell, talk to us. While we're pausing, may I ask a question? Um, I, under I think I understand. <laughs> I think I understand from the application, they want to amend the plat, and it's a 30 foot setback. And I understand what, and it's written on the permit application about the 19 feet and the eight feet for the homes um, nearby. It does the contextual street setback provision not apply here because of the plat? I believe the way that the contextual street setback applies is whichever is the more restrictive of the two between the contextual street setback, setback and a platted setback, the stricter of the two applies. And I would invite the zoning administrator to chime in if I've stated that incorrectly. I haven't looked at that specific provision in a while, but I believe that's my recollection. Hence, the 30 number on the plat being applicable here. You do see from, I think, the aerial shots, um, residences noticeably closer to the street than 30 feet. So I think that is the explanation. Would you like to continue? You may continue. Continue to talk. Oh, you can continue. Oh, I'll, I'm, I'm finished unless you have questions. I'll be glad to answer. That's, uh, okay. So another reason I want to move the house of, uh, to, uh, forward to the, like a less uh, setback because we, we have more room uh, for the, the su uh, service line to serve the neighbor. That's another reason. Uh, reason. And I uh, put a, uh, the build like a gr garage behind the building, so make it like a nice looking. Right now, the existing uh, the side plan, you can see there are two parking spaces in front of the building, which uh, I think most people don't like that anyway. So I put on the back. Yeah. I, I built the garage in, uh, behind the house, so eliminate the parking space in front of the house. So there are two units on this property that are proposed? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you can see the, the two parking spaces in front of the house, so I will eliminate that. So that's another good thing. <coughs> And the six inch sanitary line that we see between the two um, unit 1307 and 1305, that's what you're referring to. That's yeah. a service line, a service neighbor, yeah. I want to keep a little, keep a little further because now they, they explode actually. <laughs> when I dig in, they explode because the current is a layout. So I move, uh, push the building forward so they will keep a little further. So that's another good thing. Yes, the neighbor relies on that sewer line <coughs> because the, the only other uh, uh, available sewer is a block, uh, half a block away. And that service line is not on the record, actually. <coughs> okay. Any other questions? Do you have anything else to add? Not at this time, thank you. Okay. We're going to hear from the opposition. Please come forward. And please state your name and address for the record. My name is Janet Shans, no, and I live at 1001 14th Avenue South. And uh, my name is A.V. Long. I'm currently living at 1222 15th Avenue South with my mom, my mother, as a caregiver. And I have rental property on, uh, at 1310 Grand Avenue. Um, 
And I'm here representing the Edge Hill Coalition, which Who is, is the Edge Hill Coalition? It is a coalition. Is that the Edge Hill Neighbors? Is that the difference? It's, well, it's a coalition of neighborhood associations, of nonprofits, and churches. Uh, eight members came together as all this change was occurring in the Edge Hill community to join forces to com improve communication and that kind of thing. But you can find us on the web. You're the umbrella group of eight different organizations, is yes, what you're saying? Yes, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. And how many people are in the organization total then? Um, well, <laughs> uh, I mean, if... Well, let uh, me ask you another question. Okay. Did you all have a vote? Is this the official position? We did, we did, not, have a, we did not have a vote. We, the notice to this came, we only meet one Thursday a month, okay. and the notice came after our last meeting, but we did have a meeting last night about um, conservation overlays so where this was discussed. what capacity are you in today talking to us in opposition? As a, well, one, I live at 1001 14th Avenue South, okay. and I would like to submit this letter um, the neighbors surrounding this property. Yes, um, we have the letter. That yes, you so you're, yeah. So, um, and I'm here to say that we, we went through this whole thing of going from changing from R6. Well, let me ask you again. Okay, I'm sorry. Before we, okay. Are, what capacity are you, are you here as an individual or are you representing the official position of the NGO? Well, I cannot say that I, the official position because the, we have not been able to submit it to the greater okay. group because we haven't had a meeting. Okay. We, our notice so your group has not taken a stance on this position, on this property? Informally, yes. Formally, no. What does informally mean? Um, in terms of communication last night at the meeting where we probably had 40 or 50 community members. But you could have um, voted and had a resolution, but you chose not to. The nature of the meeting was Robin from Historic was there to present her, her presentation. It was not appropriate in okay. that particular meeting. Thanks. Yeah. Continue. Okay. Um, we went, fortunately, um, we have Councilman Sledge and Councilman O'Connell as our council people for the Edge Hill community. And with this onslaught of development and the neighborhood being R6, um, they proposed that they encouraged us to seek R6A. And we were able to get that passed. And um, this is really one of the first tests of this where, um, and let me give you the background, the impetus of that was um, these 3,500 square foot double buildings on these lots and a large majority of them operating as short-term rentals. And it has dramatically changed the character of our neighborhood. And um, we are concerned about the size of the two structures that Mr. Shu wants to build on this. Um, and then we, the whole point of the R6A was to create a walkable neighborhood, a, uh, a neighborhood where we didn't have um, these front-loading driveways. And there's three buildings in mean, the immediate block that Mr. Shu has been involved with that he legally built, consistent with the policy at that time. But now that we've gone to R6A, what we're asking is that he be compliant with the regulations um, so that, again, we have a more walkable, inviting neighborhood. Okay, so now I want you to put your hat back on the Edge Hill group. Okay. You obviously got together went to the council person, you were concerned about certain types of new development. Correct. And you got this bill passed specifically for these types of developments. That was one of the reasons, one yes. One of the reasons. Yes. And, but that's why it passed the council, it was introduced. Right. And so now you are here as we have an example of something. Correct. And they want all these variants, they want a setback variance so they can build something that basically would have been allowed before this Correct. R6A. Correct. Correct. May I ask a question? Yes. Why didn't you pursue a down zoning to RS zoning, which would be for single family? Um, if you're familiar with this area, we have um, a large concentration of turnkey three homes, um, which were built in the 70s, which are three bedroom, one bath homes. Um, and there's one directly behind on 13th Avenue Circle that's still, the one original owner still there. Um, it was a great program and uh, it was for first time home buyers and it worked. Um, and uh, when homeowners in this situation are presented with um, 
the market rate right now for these homes in our community for teardowns is between $350,000 and $400,000. And if a senior citizen so chooses to sell and relocate, we respect that. If we were to downzone these turnkey three homes, obviously developers would not find the property as valuable. And so at getting a consensus on downzoning the whole neighborhood would have been extremely difficult understanding people's financial interests. And I'm not all that familiar with the alternative zoning districts. Um, maybe John can answer the question, but what is the, putting the plot aside, what would be the required street setback? I mean, I, I just, I'm wondering. So I don't know, and that's okay. actually pinned to the contextual street setback question. So it would probably go beyond just the base zoning district uh, requirements. So basically you're here, because you don't want to see two on one lot, or the one that's in the forefront is too close to the road, or? Too, too close to the road. What we, what we would like is, if he built smaller houses, it would fit. It would meet the guidelines. But it's not in his interest. Um, it's his interest to get a variance, as he is a short-term rental operator in the neighborhood. And it's in his interest to have a large building and to maximize the rental capacity and rent. So we, we understand that, but that's the very thing we're trying to, <laughs> if you've gone through there, we're, we're really trying to limit this because we have been inundated. I'm familiar, yeah. I drive yes. through that area to get to my office, so Yes, yes we've been inundated. So we're just trying to hang on to our residential character mm -hmm. in our community, and uh, um, Councilman O'Connell really felt like R6A was the first step, and like I said, we are meeting with for a conservation overlay to go through that process for part of the neighborhood. So we're in the process of trying, um, we're late to the game, but we're trying to step it up and, and get some protections. Well, I can appreciate your efforts because about seven months ago, my neighborhood went through similar down zoning and contextual overlay efforts. Okay. So I can appreciate what yes. you all have done for your neighborhood. Well, we're, we're trying, we're not there yet, so yeah. Okay. What would you have to add? Um, well, I just wrote, you know, uh, some of my thoughts and about the situation. And uh, just to add a little bit more about Edge Hill Neighborhood Oh, did you identify yourself for the record? Uh, yes, I'm eight. Uh-huh. Yes. Do I need to do it again? No, no. no. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, um, I guess maybe it is a little different from a lot of neighborhoods, but we have, we do have lots of organizations in Edge Hill. Mm -hmm. I'm a member of a group called the Story Project, which does like research and we, we're just about a year old. I've also been a member of ONE for many years. Mm -hmm. We have EVNA, various churches, Edge Hill Neighborhood Partnership. So it's lots of different organizations and we try to, so when we have the coalition members, we don't have everybody from all those organizations, okay. but two or three people to represent, we try to get that to represent. So these are just, these are uh, my feelings about the neighborhood and this situation, and also several other people that I've talked to. Um, many members of our Edge Hill community have worked very hard to change the zoning in our neighborhood from R6 to R6A. We made this change in an effort to preserve the integrity of our neighborhood, specifically to increase walkability and maintain as much green space as possible. If capital investors slash property owners are allowed to continuously make exceptions to the regulations specified in R6A zoning, that causes frustration and hardship to long-term residents. Also, it has been brought to our attention that there are only 22 STR permits designated for our community, but there are approximately 90 properties advertised in our neighborhood as Airbnb. Because of various concerns and issues in regards to STRs, as members of this community, we become very suspicious when we see the construction for these mega houses, because more often than not, regardless of what is up of, in spite of, I guess I should say, in spite of what might be put on paper, their use of the mega houses a lot of times end up being short-term rentals rather than single-family long-term use. Any questions? Do you have anything else to add? Thank you for being here. We'll Thank hear you. from the applicant again. Yeah. Oh. 
Please continue. It's rebuttal right. time. The, um, I'm repeating myself, I understand, but by moving this house uh, forward, it's already, uh, the, the uh, comments that were made by uh, just now are, uh, I don't, I don't think, uh, deal with the fact that this property is already zoned for these two, two buildings. It's perfectly, uh, they're not violating any of the zoning requirements by having two 3,500 square foot buildings on there. Um, and there's, uh, by moving it forward, it would allow parking in the rear rather than uh, a restriction that would require it to be, or that would permit it to be in the in the front, and I think that's the walkability, our neighborhood, or appearance. I think, uh, in my own opinion, and Mr. Shoes, opinion, that's that would be a positive. It certainly uh, improves uh, the situation in the rear yard, where the parking would be, and it would give more space to uh, not conflict with this existing sewer, sewer line that serves the neighbor. So uh, th those would be uh, the points that I would like to, to bring out uh, uh, that actually are, are, are positive and not negative uh, by, a lot, by a lot of, uh, uh, I don't think a lot of commentary would agree with that, but do you have anything to say, Mr. Yeah, I, I heard the uh, now the zoning changed from the uh, R6 to R6-A, uh, uh, and uh, when I apply for a building permit, and uh, actually at that time, the zoning is still like R6, I think they allow me to put uh, two parkings in front of the building. Now I want to eliminate, actually it's better, it's positive things, I don't, yeah. I just want to point out that. Did, yeah. did I hear one of you say, I think Mr. Hsu said that maybe the uh, the sewer, the yes. six-inch set wasn't on the original plat? Uh, the, the service line uh, uh, served to the neighbor. That line is, uh, is doesn't show on the record. It's a metro, like uh, have some information. So you, you discovered it when you were surveying or? Yes, it, it didn't show up on any um, plat or anything. On any plat. And no easement. We researched at the registrar's office for for an easement. There's actually no uh, no easement. It's just uh, yeah, just lying. Uh, it's just in the ground. To yeah. the neighbor to cross yeah. uh, from yeah. uh, one property to the other. Yeah. So the, uh, I should I should I, I would like to keep a little further from that line. Now it's uh, almost on the building of the corner. <laughs> so that's another thing. So. This is a very positive, I think, to move forward. Because Do you have a copy of the survey that shows the sewer? Uh, it's on yeah. that it's uh, larger. Yeah, you can see the picture, uh, oh, actually. The big one, okay. <coughs> I'll look at the top. The photo also shows that line, actually. There's one photo shows that the PVC line on the corner of the building. Anything else to add? I think that's it. Oh, okay. Um, any other questions? We're going to close the public hearing discussion. I'll start by reading the email from Councilman O'Connor, who could not be here today, who um, says to Mr. Herbert, Bill, I'm concerned about the BZA case 2017-219 today on Grand Avenue. We have worked closely and thoroughly through, uh, with the neighbors to preserve the both character and walkability by transitioning multiple parcels in Edgehill from R6 to R6A. This variant seems to ignore, I mean, this variant seeks to ignore that zoning change which is incredibly important to the area residents. I would prefer if the board would deny the request. So the council person who worked on this legislation basically saying that there was a reason for the legislation, we heard from the neighbors, and that basically he's wanting to build like the legislation never got passed. And to me, 
I think the council person is right. And there was a reason that they just very recently, Councilman O'Connor's only been in the Metro Council a couple years, that this was recently passed. And if this board rules in the favor of the applicant, we are overturning basically the duly passed legislation that this district wanted for this particular area. <laughs> I think the applicants made good points, but I agree with you. Um, they don't necessarily have to build two on one lot. They're, they're here today because they're not allowed to build on two on one lot with them. Um, they have to ask us for a variance. So, um, so I'm inclined to agree with you on that. Well, what do you got? Okay, for that reason, um, I, unless someone else has something else to say. I move that we deny the variance of the front setback requirement of this R6A district because they did not prove a hardship. I second it. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Me. Okay, it passes four to two. John Michael. The next case to be presented to the court, to the board is the final case to be presented to the board this evening. It's case number 2017-228 involving the property at 809 Main Street. The Dean Design Group is the appellant for Lila Top Hospitality, the owner of the property located at 809 Main Street in East Nashville, specifically right at the edge of Council District Number 6. Board members, you've already heard from the District Council Member on this case as Councilman Withers, Withers addressed the board at the beginning of our meeting. Looks like as the room will have clear, there will be no opposition present. Therefore, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. The request is for a parking variance. The zoning district is MUG, Mixed Use General A alternative. Uh, the count is 122, I believe, from the staff report um, with a off-site parking agreement that the appellants refer to. Their count would be up to 76, hence the reduction down to uh, what, 46, I guess, is the amount of the variance for the 76 they provided, with 122 being the count. The aerial photo here shows the property in its prior iteration before construction began. Site plan submitted at least as to this lower level plan gives an indication of the 56 enumerated spaces on site, separate from the 20 that are indicated for off site. From my recent site visit, the lower right hand uh, corner obviously shows the construction project underway as it's prepared for the structure, upper left hand corner across the street to Nance Nashville Institution Weiss Liquors. The view up and down Main Street here, the upper and lower left-hand corners, or upper left showing inbound, lower right showing outbound. Uh, again, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation on this variance. Please introduce yourself by name and address and take it up with the board. Hello, my name is Charles. You just turned it off. On, oh, good. Um, hello, my name is Charlie Dean with Dean Design Group. Uh, 1633 West Main Street, Suite 1002 in Lebanon, Tennessee. And my name is Adam Leibowitz with Lila Tove Hospitality Holdings, LLC, uh, located at 2515 Nolensville Pike, Nashville 37211. Uh, I'm the civil engineer on the project, and Adam's here representing the owner and developer. Um, <clears throat> we have a Fieldhouse Jones Hotel uh, proposed for this property, and it has a, a small portion of um, retail space, commercial space in, in the ground level. Um, it also includes a parking lot um, currently permitted uh, on the approved plans, which we're constructing now, coming off of Main Street. Um, we are here requesting a 46-space uh, variance for the uh, parking requirement. Uh, what this is uh, would be a function of uh, the parking lot that we have coming off Main Street. As we went through the review process, uh, planning encouraged us to try to find a way to activate that space more and eliminate the parking along that Main Street corridor. Um, we agreed to, uh, once we were permitted under construction, we agreed to come back and request the variance um, to remove that parking lot and fill that with a more activated space. Um, the uh, the property um, is kind of dog-eared with a combination sewer line. 
uh, in the back and uh, also drops about uh, 10 or 11 feet from Main Street back to the the, the, um, the alley behind us. So, you know, it really limits what we're able to do with uh, multi-level parking. Uh, be happy to answer any other questions that you have, but um, that's that's the crux of why you're I'm asking for 46 parking space variants. Yes, sir. And that's a lot. Why are you asking for so many? Uh, and where are those cars going to go? Well, uh, I think it's been uh, mentioned by both Councilman Withers, uh, Councilman Davis, Planning. Uh, I know has submitted a letter, and uh, as well as um, our submittal. Uh, this is certainly the kind of use that's going to, uh, you know, bring people in that aren't going to have their own cars. You know, certainly. But where did you come up chairs. with that number? Like half the people that would stay at your hotel wouldn't have cars. Where do you get that? Well, from? the, you know, as, as I've kind of outlined in the last paragraph of the letter, uh, what we did is we essentially uh, used that space that. Uh, that we'd be converting from the, I guess, the Main Street level lot to that. Um, and we've uh, estimated that space to be leased as restaurant. But to um, me, even if you <coughs> took away that retail space and just made that all parking, you'd still be short for the hotel parking, right? No. You wouldn't? No, we're currently permitted. We're currently... Um, uh, we, we need the with 95 rooms, you'd still? Not, it's uh, 93. 93 rooms. And the, they're because you, you, we also get certain reductions uh, for the UZO, for the UZO and, and for bus line. And uh, yeah. it, 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 the, the, the math worked out. So um, I, if you don't mind, Charlie, Absolutely. I could try to mm -hmm. help with, you had asked where the other cars would mm -hmm. go. Um, so I don't know if it's possible to pull up the, uh, the tax map or the just the aerial view. All right. So. Um, you have the, 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 the lot of 809 Main where the hotel will be located, and then you have the gray building next to it, which is 807 Main, and then you have an empty lot next door to that. Um, uh, the owner of the uh, empty lot, uh, I happen to be uh, an owner of that one along with one of the partner. Uh, we both happen to be uh, partners in the hotel. So that is one spot where we would be able to use the utilize. empty lot there. Mm -hmm. How come that's not part of the proposal then? It, I th it actually, is. it is. It's, it's, oh, it's it the is. 20 okay. offsite spaces. Yeah. So, I mean, but that's not solving the problem well, of 46. Sure. I've, I've got additional space also. Um, right across the street, um, I also happen to own that property where the uh, 800 Main Street, and we have. And how many parking spaces are over there? Oh, um, well over 100. Then how come they're all not using and you're not in front of us then? If you, um, if you used all the parking for this, per, then you didn't have no, to. No, we haven't them. used them yet. No, but if you did, if you dedicated it to this project, then you wouldn't need a variance, right? Is there are 100 parking spaces across the street <coughs> that you control? I, along with other partners, yes. Okay, so why don't you add more parking and a lot that you control with other partners, and then you don't need a variance? Um, well... I guess to back up a bit, um, we were requested to come in f uh, to the BZA through discussions with planning uh, to get a, a variance provided. I understand that. that. That doesn't answer my question, though. My question was, you own 100 parking spaces, you and your partners across the street. Why don't you use them for this project, and then you don't need any variance? One, I would, I would imagine that there would probably be pushback from MDHA and from planning or public works. If MDHA would care, they, they would object to having hotel guests park in an already striped surface parking lot? I think that the concern would be safety of crossing Main Street. If there's safety concerns crossing the street, then why are you using any of the parking? Well, right now we're not. I thought in your application you said there are a handful of spaces for your application that are in the on lot. the same side of the street, on the same side of the street, where the where he's indicated yeah. the vacant lot on the other side of the uh, 807. So structure. how many parking spaces are in this lot that you propose in the upper and lower level? Because the sheet that I have, it looks like they're 50. You're saying you're saying what's being built with the main street lot? Yeah, it's like 56. Is that right? Uh, on the lower level, yes. On the lower level, 56 on the lower level, and then another. I think really it's 21. It's uh. 
21 on the upper level, so 77. Parking is a big issue in this city, and it's a big issue in front of this board. We've heard lots of cases over the years where, particularly in already congested neighborhoods, 12 South is one of them, Charlotte's one of them, that if you don't have proper parking, people are gonna bring their cars and park somewhere. And I will read this letter you probably saw from the owner of some adjacent properties and how Billings Harwell. She said, Dear Sir, as the owner of the two neighboring properties on Main Street, 714 Main Street and 734 Main Street, I oppose the variance from parking requirement requested by the Dean Design Group. It is irresponsible to construct commercial space with reduced parking. Parking is always a necessity, and each development should provide more than adequate parking. So what do you say to her? It's the first I've heard this. So. Okay. You didn't talk to uh, any of your neighbors? Well, there was, problem? no, actually I did get a call from the neighbor that actually owns the, there's another lot, I think it may be, um, well, actually, yeah, next door to, I think, where this um, um, owner is, and he asked me what we were planning on doing. I told him, he said, okay, that's that's fine, I, I, I understand. Um, he's also probably going to be wanting to develop his property at a later date. Uh, it's right now, it's an empty lot. So, for example, if... 80 or 90 percent of your hotel guests and all retail people fill up this lot and then there's not space for others, where are they going to park or what are your plans for that? Well, I, th I think that according to what we've heard from planning department is that about 30 percent, maybe 40 percent of hotel users will end up coming with their own vehicles. That's uh, according to what, and again, this is, um, um, I may be, uh, paraphrasing what I've been told, and I don't have anything uh, in writing. To back this is up. what planning says. Metro planning is in strong support of the proposed parking variance for the, the your project, which allows more ground floor retail space to be located along Main Street, a major high capacity transit corridor. Main Street Gallatin Pike has been identified in the first light rail corridor in Metro and MTA's in motion transit plan. Active ground floor uses critical components in supporting future high capacity transit line in the stretch of Main Street. So they admit basically this isn't, light rail isn't here today, it's planned, but it's not here today. Mm -hmm. In addition, in the anticipated that the transit line will reduce the reliance on automobiles and subsequent parking needs for developments along the transit route. Additionally, the proposed hotel will attract users arriving via car sharing providers, taxis, bus, and future high capacity transit service. This multimodal service will lessen the demand for on site parking, for parking on site. Um, the applicant has committed to using off site parking on the neighboring properties if needed. It doesn't say anything about being dangerous. So, this also does not say anything about how many will be using ride sharing, buses, taxis. Well, and I'm not sure that can be known. Uh, as far as, you know, the, I'm not sure that can be quantified. Well, if it can't be quantified, that's why I'm concerned, because we are a kind of city and a nation that still likes our cars. Yes, we have lots of tourists and visitors here, but you're thinking of having 46 spaces less than what the law requires. And if those people show up to a very popular neighborhood to shop or to stay in this hotel, where are they going to park? Where are those cars going to go? Well, Mr. Chairman, if I could, mm -hmm. um, I met with the applicants, um, and it's been, what, six weeks ago, probably a month ago, something like that. And I apologize, I have so many meetings that it's really, really, really hard for me to keep them all straight. And guys, um, I clearly remember our meeting. I just don't remember the substance of everything that we talked about. Um, uh, I was aware that the planning department was supporting this project wholeheartedly. Um, and um, 
And if, if, it, if the board is inclined to not approve this project, uh, I might suggest, and if it was okay with you all, that perhaps we defer it one meeting and, and let, let us sit down and revisit again. And I apologize, I just can't remember because I remember during our meeting, um, I thought that uh, I didn't see any real issues, but I just cannot remember the substance of everything that we talked about. So if, uh, if, I, it, I if it's a real concern. I would like to ask a question sure, before we move to defer anything. Mm -hmm. um, why aren't you building you know, more of a parking structure to accommodate the parking needs? We, we really don't have the ability to build a parking structure because of the, the there is a utility combination, sewer, combination line. sewer line that traverses across the property. Um, it, it took, uh, a lot of very creative planning to even get the amount of parking that we, we do have. Um, so you're saying you can't build down because you will you disturb the that. The sewer line. Yeah. But can you build up anymore? Not, not for, you don't have really, there's not, um, from an efficiency standpoint, you don't have good turning <laughs> corridors to get through the, the uh, a, a parking structure. Um, it, it, from a financial standpoint, it, it wouldn't make any sense. You'd be building so yeah, many more. We don't, we're not uh, considering financial that, that's fine. burdens here. Yeah, I, I, will, I will say this though. I mean, one of the things that I think from this to help maybe answer about the number of spaces, because I, 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 I hear your concern mm -hmm. and we share that concern. Um, one of the, the, what we've done with this is what we've tried to outline is what the maximum number of potential, uh, I guess, deficient spaces we would we would have. If, for example, the, the whole idea behind this is that planning wants to see an activated street front and to hopefully at one day eliminate that, that curb cut so that you're not having cars coming in and out along Main Street in any more places than, than necessary. <coughs> I, I don't know if you guys have. No, we, we have all that. Okay, so, so I, if I could then. No, I guess my. Well, well I, I think I can help answer this. And okay. If you'll just give me one more, one more minute. This doesn't have to be full restaurant. So the 46 is related to the idea if we, if we went to the highest density use in that space. So it could be that we end up deciding that we want to put in more rooms. Maybe it's four or five more rooms, which obviously wouldn't have the same density as, uh, uh, necessary as restaurant in that space. Or it could be a fitness room, okay. could be other amenity yep, space. I agree. So, but here's where we are. You're asking for 46 per, uh, parking variants. That's huge. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Mr. Herbert, and I really think that we need to hear from more people and we need to defer this case so you can bring us more information and particularly about this, you know, how many people will really have cars. You know, it's speculative about, you know, future transit. I think it's going to happen, but, you know, that's might be a couple years down the road before light rail comes past your uh, business. So in the meantime, what are we going to do? One more thing yes. to ask. Um, did you say that you already took into consideration the discounts you get? And discounts is not the right word, but the UZO reductions. reductions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you take already take that into yes, account? Yes. And did you do the full 20%? Is that what it is? We did. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. The two, it was related to sidewalks and transit. I think bus right. line and. Bus line, and yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So really, if you were out of the UZO, you would actually be required to provide more parking. <clears throat> sure. Okay. Well, just like, I mean, you could kind of make the same argument with downtown uh, code is that. They're not required the parking, but yet people want to drive downtown. So. so, you know, it's up to you, but that would be my recommendation that we defer this at least one meeting so we could get more information because this is a big ask of 46 mm -hmm. in, a, in an area that has a lot of restaurants and a lot of traffic and a lot of cars looking to park in a very limited amount of space. Can, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. uh, would it make a difference if we said, hey, look, uh, what if we just reduce the ask? To what? Uh, 25 spaces. And then that, and so where do, 
you just can't reduce the ask without reducing the massing of the hotel and well, because no, actually it's, that's, it's, it's yeah. use based the, yeah. you know the, the parking requirement is use based like we said essentially what we did is we said if we take away this this yeah. upper level parking entirely yeah. and fill it with the restaurant which is the highest the highest to me density. that's still a lot of cars that you know I'm not saying it's not a lot of cars what I'm saying is is the ask I know based on but, a number the numbers based on but use. I, I think 25 is still a very big ask too okay. I really do, and I think for that reason we need more information because this is a very popular area, as you know, with more kind of retail establishments and other housing and businesses coming in the area, it's only going to get worse. And that you're asking for 46 or 25 or variance in our parking code, where are those cars going to go on East, in East Nashville? So, Chairman, what information do you propose they bring back? Real information based on you know an average hotel of this size in this you know area, how many people really drive a car, you know depending on a restaurant, you know what's the average part of how many people take public transit versus all these other things for an upscale hotel and an upscale restaurant. We do have to consider that both the council member and uh, well, I guess if if um, Bill is willing willing to meet with them, then, you know, we get some more information. But we do have a council member who said yeah, you know, I today that he's no, I realize that. Two council members. But, yeah, yeah, two. But that's right, Scott. Davis. To me, parking is one of the largest complaints that we get in this yeah. as we approve things or not approve things. And, but I, I, and that's a big number. I guess we're still open meeting, but, I mean, part of the parking issue is how many how many cars a business brings to an area. And the whole point of, of a of a hotel parking number is that they don't bring cars there there's a lot of parking contained on this site now if this were all retail and or all restaurant then i could see the potential for overflow parking but i mean but i just think i mean even the applicant has kind of suggested a, a lower number i just don't think that this is well thought out as far as where these extra cars are going to go and how many um, well, I'm, I'm just saying really coming to this I'm not, I don't want to make their argument for them. I'm, I'm just saying as an architect, I mean, that, that's this is the way that I would have to approach it. I, I would take the worst case scenario. So right. what's what is the, the the highest impact as far as parking number would go? Can we achieve that? And and if we can't, you know, then what's what's the next level? You know, it, it's I mean, I don't, I don't know what else they they could bring. I mean, they planning. could bring more spaces, or they could use utilize some spaces across the but, street. But that's making the assumption that all those parking spaces are needed, and I don't see there's any evidence that those spaces are needed. Well, and neither does planning or well, the, the code. Two obviously, councilmen. thinks it is because. Yeah, but we have a pretty regressive code when it comes to parking. I mean, most. But that's, most, what, that's what the code says. Most they need 46 more spaces, and they're asking. Most people not that know what they're talking about when it comes to parking urban planning will say we need to be planning. I don't want to get too in the weeds on policy here, but we need. We need maximum parking, not minimum parking. And this is a minimum parking argument that we're making. And a hotel does not bring cars to the neighborhood. It's it's the other businesses. Yes. But the code says 46 spaces, and that's a large amount to ask for without a lot of information. And so I, that's I, why I think it's I don't know in what everyone's other information they can bring. To defer. I have a question. Maybe they can answer. That sure. could be helpful information. Did you look at a valet option? For you know the hotel or for the restaurant, I guess valet would only work in a restaurant situation and yeah, hotel. Work in a hotel. Work at a hotel. Uh, yeah. Restaurant and hotel, as opposed to I think there was co other type of commercial space proposed. Yeah. Um, so so the answer is yes. In fact, uh, what we looked at during the design review process and the permitting process was that along Neal Avenue we will have a, a drop off area that we could utilize for valet. We're not planning on using valet right now, but if we, uh, if, if that were something that is in the future plans, then we could use that, and then we could either park underneath at our own property, or as I stated before, and uh, uh, Mr. Ewing, it, the, we do have in, pl in place, we had at 807, and I'm sorry, 805 Main, we were going to designate that, have a agreement in, in place, uh, which I know what I think what you're saying is we don't need to have a parking variance if yeah. we have sure. that in place. Yeah. Um, I think that so so we could always put more cars on the same side of the street as where we are currently and not have to cross over to Main Street. 
Um, the, and Mr. Harper, I, I, what you were articulating is, is exactly correct in terms of the issue with us bringing more information. While I, I can appreciate the, the desire for that, we did exactly that. We wanted to present, this is the maximum, this is the maximum that it would require, but yet we don't have that space filled in yet. So it could be that we decide that we're not going to put a, re a full restaurant in there and that we end up, it could be just amenity space. But you're saying could be, but you've proposed something here today. Exactly, in front because of we us. want to have that flexibility. Because oh. what we would want to do is if, in, in, unless we know what we have, mm -hmm. we can't go out to market to try to lease out that space. I think we need more concrete terms if you're offering, you're wanting a 46 space parking variance. That's a lot of cars. Okay. And all I think I'm asking, and Mr. Herbert, I think, implied might be helpful, is a deferral of a meeting and talk to planning, talk to him and others, and let's figure out a better scenario than 46 faces. And, and I'm fine with that. But I guess my, my question would be back to you is that how, how are we supposed to then determine what number works for, would work so that, in essence, if you, if you said 20 spaces works and that's what you're comfortable with, then I would that's know. That's a big ass too. Well, 20 got, space variance of parking? Yes, that's a lot of. Okay. Look, More, I, 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 it, it, I don't know. Because the, the code uh, requires that and you're saying, I want 46 less spaces or 20 less spaces and the code requires. Okay. That's a lot to ask. Please for. understand, I'm here because we were requested to go forward with this. I know. Okay? So I feel like I'm getting beaten up on something that I'm trying to do as a, as a, a good steward for this city as I well. Know. But do you understand what the role of this board is? The role of this board is to look at variances. You could not appear in front of this board and just build to what the code says, but you have come here asking to build 46 parking spaces less and trying to make your argument that this would be fine and wouldn't impact anybody from the neighboring properties. And I'm saying that's a lot, and I'm not sure if that's true. The assumptions about how many people will really park as guests of the hotel or retail or whatever you have there. Okay. And so that's why I think in, with all people involved, and you could get your council person involved again, that I think more needs to be determined about this very large request of a variance in front of us. I'm going to ask another question. Um, I understand planning is in support and needs to be looked at zoning wise again. Doesn't public works have to look at this parking garage as well? I mean, I don't see a loading space right off. So have they be talking? There's a loading space have you sp along Neal. Spoken to public works. It's been a long day. Where's sure. the loading space? I'd it's along it. Neal. It's along Neal. Okay. So you have had conversations with Public Works? Well, Public Works sits on MDHA's uh, design review committee. So um, they, they were, this came up earlier on of the idea, hey, you know, would you guys consider doing this? And so they were a part of that conversation, but we have not engaged them since that time. Uh, it's really been uh, conversations with planning. Um, and then uh, we would be going back to design review for any further uh, approvals before we could go forward with closing in that space. We just need to know whether or not we, we would be allowed to close it in. So, but public yeah. works, I would imagine, would be pretty happy with the idea of losing a curb cut yeah, on Main Street. Yeah, getting rid of a curb cut on Main Street. They, they, that's that's their preference, and maybe I'm out of out of turn to speak for them there. So you've had an informal review with public works via MDHA's review board. Yeah, they're, they, they but have you haven't on. submitted to Public Works or well, spoken public, with Public them. Works approved what we have under construction right yeah. now. Yeah, and that includes the curb cut on Main. Right. And my understanding is, is everything that gets submitted to this board also gets reviewed by Public Works. What do you have under construction right now? The hotel. The hotel. Well, we've already been approved to, to build it with the garage. So and, 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 and with the lot on Main. Mm -hmm. What we're asking for is to be able to close the lot on Main and, and fill in that space with, with, uh, with a more activated space. And, and, and this was a matter of that after that we had conversations with the planning that said, hey, look, 
we, we need to keep moving. They said, that's fine. They said, we'd like for you to apply for a parking variance to eliminate the um, traffic that would be coming in and out along Main Street. Uh, and so we said, okay, we'll, we'll work with you on that. So to be clear, we're, we're talking about the uh, 22 spaces. So it, it's, again, you're, you're sort of juggling these balls. You're, you're getting rid of 22 spaces, but adding square footage, which, right. which increases and, the and, demand. And we completely so. understand that, that it's a big ask. And, and in fact, that was a big, that was, that was a, a big point of when we were talking with planners, that, you know, how do we even get this approved? And they said we, we, they felt like it, that there was a good chance to do so, and they wanted us to go forward with it, and we said that's fine. And we, you know, we don't know what the exact use is going to be. We've tried to um, look at different scenarios. We've, we've, we've got some ideas with if we added some rooms towards the back of, of, of that space and then activated maybe just uh, two or 3,000 square feet as additional retail or commercial or restaurant space so you wouldn't have the same parking requirement. But again, the, the, uh, what Charlie and I decided to do for pre presentation was to provide what the maximum would look like and then that, that way we could go from there. Um, if there's if there's a need to lower it or defer, then well, that's fine. I think a one meeting deferral would be helpful just to sure. you know talk about this and yeah. come back and maybe if you can really say that all these people that in a hotel a comparable hotel like this people take ride sharing people take the bus or whatever but there's really been nothing kind of concrete said in front of us and there's. As you know, there's Smith Travel Research up in Hendersonville, which mm -hmm. is the premier kind of hospitality company. They might have some numbers about how many people in Nashville, Tennessee, either rent a car that stay in hotels versus taking taxis or public transit or ride sharing. And I think those that's appropriate. But all I know is this is a very clogged corridor already with a lot of popular restaurants and bars and breweries and the fact that you're asking for 46 space variants, to me, I think would be um, bad for the area if all these extra cars really do show up. And if you can find that we're a hotel and most of these people will come by p p ride sharing, but we really don't know that, do we? Just to be sure, and you can answer his question in a second, but just to be sure I understand it, you can actually get your UNO as is. As you're, is. you're just trying to... Build the retail. But you're trying to, in the future, mm -hmm. get rid of a parking lot that's on Main Street. Right. That's correct. So, and, and, and another thing was... This is what you have approval for. That's correct. That's right. And you're asking for... The 46 would get you... This, if one of those was a restaurant, if all, if if, if everything in the uh, color-wise, yeah. if everything in tenant A and tenant B was a restaurant. So if if you added ten thousand feet of square, ten thousand square feet of restaurant, you would generate supposedly the forty-six additional parking well, we, spaces that we you're need for. The, now tenant B is already going in. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, so just tenant A. Right. Okay. Yeah. A little, little now. The what you see on your drawing is tenant B. Um, if we closed it in, it adds about 400 square feet from what's currently uh, right. being being constructed. Sure. Uh, just with that little leaf off off the left side. So, what do you want to do? <clears throat> I'm game. Whatever you'd like. That's not what I'd like. Uh, we've made suggestions, of course. Oh, I mean, you're, the, you're, I, you're the one that's... No, but I think the process will work better if with just one simple one meeting deferral, just to kind of bring all these parties together. As Mr. Herbert said, and he's overworked like everybody else on our team, he doesn't very specifically remember this project, so it would just be good to kind of get well, everyone back around the table. I'll, well, I, I, I think that you know, we can do that. I think what we uh, were here... Uh, because we met with the councilman and, and he's mm -hmm. fine with it. We yep. met with the other councilman yep. and he's fine with it. Mm -hmm. We met with planning, yes. they're mm -hmm. fine with it. We met with codes and they're fine with it. So every, getting everybody else around the table, 
again, I don't know that that's going to change. None of those people have a vote at the Board of Zoning Appeals, I'm not and therefore I will renew the zoning administrator's polite suggestion that we sit down, even if it's not with all of those people, just with the zoning administrator who will be present at the next board meeting to potentially assist with answering the board's questions in a way that helps present your case in the manner that you find most helpful. Of course, the board could also take up the question with an up or down vote today if you prefer. We'll just defer. How many meetings? One, two? Let's do one. Okay. Do we have a motion? Do we need to close the public hearing? Oh, let's close the public hearing. Motion. I, I move that we defer uh, this to the next meeting. When is the next meeting, John Michael? September 21. September 21. Um, sir, I'm, I'm yes. sorry, but that I won't be present. It's uh, Rosh Hashanah. It's Jewish New Year. Ooh. All right, two meetings. Why are we meeting on Rosh Hashanah? Um, it was scheduled long in advance before we yeah, checked John calendars Michael. for holidays. Seriously? Come on, man. Yeah, you know, it's only once a year. <laughs> oh. All right, two meetings. Two meetings. So I'm someone second my first motion. Second. So we're really meeting on... Oh. Okay. I don't have a second yet. I'll second. Okay. Right. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Um, all those in favor of the motion uh, to two meetings. What's the second? October 5. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 So, so we're meeting on October 5th. I'm sorry we're meeting in Rosh Hashanah. We should not be. Okay. Um, we will see you all. John Michael, anything else? Nothing further. That concludes the board's business for today.